Today on the podcast, we have a conversation with Daniel Joachim Cliven, who is a Norwegian economist and philosopher with a fondness for Aristotle and St. Thomas. And we originally reached out to him because he wrote this really interesting article on IAI about the fact that the laws of nature don't actually do a very good job of explaining anything. And if you've listened to the podcast for any period of time, you know that this is kind of one of our favorite horses, where you have a mathematical law that tells you something about nature. And for many, many cases, it seems to be that that is where inquiry stops. There is no deeper inquiry as to why that law is. And so through this philosophical lens, we spend our time together exploring the question of what does it mean to derive first cause and what are the implications for devoting yourself to actually understanding that, both on a scientific level and on a very human and social level. Yeah, we're really working towards in the end well, what comes next? If scientific laws aren't the end-all, be-all, what more could there be in the objective pursuit of understanding nature? And the conclusions that we get to are, might be kind of shocking. So hold on to your chairs. As always, a huge thank you to our patrons. You guys allow us to do this podcast. You allow us to devote all of our time to this project. Granted, we're still teaching at the university and picking up odd jobs here and there, but we are able to make this happen every single week, twice a week. And so thank you immensely for that. If you are thinking of donating because you've listened to some episodes and you've really enjoyed it, the link for that is right up here. You can donate as little as I think either $1 or $3 a month. And it's not a lot for one person, but it really adds up when people support us. Thank you to everybody who's already done so. Yeah, I'm told that you can donate, what you can enter whatever value you want, and, and you get away with it. So it doesn't really matter, and all those little donations add up a lot. You can also come and support the podcast by visiting our first live event this year in Austin, Texas, April 7th and 8th. We're going to get together, watch the total solar eclipse, and enjoy a number of really close-knit workshops and talks with some of our favorite speakers. So you can check out a link for that event up here. Otherwise, yeah, just share the podcast with somebody. You can help out in the tiniest ways. You don't even have to give any money. Just mention it. Give us a review. Give it a subscribe. Give it a like. And I really hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. So sit back and relax. And we present Daniel Joaquin Cliven. The scientific revolution starts now. We were working at these places, at this place in the sciences where the mathematical abstractions of laws became material bodies in motion, right? You have like quantum field theory is atoms and electrons and responsible for all these interactions between very, very small structures inside the cell. And when you ask somebody like, okay, well, yes, this is the equation, but what lies beneath the equation? They kind of look at you like it's the dumbest question that they've ever heard in their entire lives. <laughs> and we just became obsessed. We were like, well, there must be something. There must yeah. be something. And we discovered that like nobody's really thinking that way. Like what Shiloh said, it's like this piece that you wrote about like, what does it mean to put together a law of nature? Like what have we actually explained? For some reason, it's really rare. It's a really rare perspective. And it's really at the heart of why we even started this this media project in the first place. It's like, we've been through a number of iterations and now we don't do only physics anymore or, or only metaphysics. We're, <laughs> we're all over the map uh, just because our interests have grown over, over the last couple of years. But we started it fundamentally having recognized this strange crisis where the mathematization of nature passes as a mechanistic explanation and it was driving us up a wall and we couldn't believe that nobody else was concerned about this. Which is why the puppets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we used to just call up physicists and harass them basically as puppets. But we had this whole story where we were like aliens that had like different metaphysics and we came to Earth and we were trying to understand how humans had arrived at these metaphysics and it was just... Everyone... But everybody thought it was a children's show, so it, it just didn't work. Um, 
Anyway, so that, that's, I guess, a little bit of background on us. And um, we still work in the universities periodically. Um, I, I'm teaching one class there right now. Anastasia is teaching last semester. Maybe maybe in the future, we'll see. But we're, we're not doing academic research per se. So yeah. So that's us. That's what we're doing here. Yeah. And yeah, your that's, philosophy? That's very interesting. And it sounds like our interests uh, line up. Just the need to sort of couple a philosophy of nature with the uh, philosophy of science. Yeah, how did you get into that? What where, what's your path to having reason to the, yourself to these ideas? Well, that's a it's a good question. I guess it started with uh, with mine, really, uh, sort of trying to conserve a well, just trying to preserve a view of nature that uh, allows for uh, the real, um, yeah, a real place of mind. Because if uh, you got all of this reductionist view of mind in our uh, contemporary day and age, and they are sort of justified by science, which is really the mathematization that you're talking about. But of course, no, no, nothing can be more important to uh, to us than preserving a, a real role for the mind, because uh, it's through our mind that we learn about things. And uh, if <laughs> if I cannot trust that my senses really reach out into the world and capture something that's really there, and if I cannot be certain that my mental processes, my my logical processes are in, in accordance with something that's not just the uh, irrational uh, forces of nature, then uh, yeah, really my my cognitive faculties wouldn't be doing anything else than just uh, a rock down, falling down a hill. And that's uh, that's kind of a catastrophe because it it, it might sound it might sound nice at the and at an abstract level. But of course that would also give me a reason to doubt everything I learned about anything, because uh, nothing I've learned I've ever learned through rational processes. So yeah, that that really made me delve into a, a yeah different view about the philosophy of nature and what what is nature really, and what uh, what are these things that we call laws and what uh, do they really explain? Like in other words, when you navigate the universe as a human being. You spend a lot of time in your head conceptualizing different environments, different social situations, different future trajectories for your life. All of these mental processes have nothing to do with you physically bumping into a wall and learning how to navigate the room because there's a wall there. I mean, you, little kids do this a little bit to some extent. They're definitely more in the physical realm of learning, but uh, very quickly they're conceptualizing and, and, and creating maps of reality. And in some sense, our best hope in science is to have a good map of reality, I suppose. Yeah. And I guess uh, one of the questions is how, how we create that map. Is that map just sort of project projections from ourselves onto the world? That there's nothing really there's nothing really out there in the world, but they are all just projections from, from us? So really a kind of nominalism that all of the concepts are really just in our own head. But then how can we share it? How can we make languages and so on? And how can we really trust our faculties to say something true about the world at all? Did you did you study philosophy or did you come to this just because it was kind of your your natural bent to think this way? <laughs> well, uh, I'll, uh, another long story short, I, I'm really an economist by trade. Um, in the bottom, I, I come from a family of, uh, of businessmen and, and so on. And I also created a small business for my, for myself. But uh, yeah, philosophy has always been my passion. Like the the most fun thing about studying uh, economics was, um, yeah, was uh, studying uh, like the the economic rationality of man, which really got me going. <laughs> so I saw that well, economics and philosophy is not that really that widely separated. And Adam Smith was a moral philosopher, so yeah, that really uh, made me delve into philosophy. So I. I I had it as a hobby. I studied at night, and then suddenly I I started taking some uh, credits as well. So I ended up with a master's. And one of the things that I find really fun right now is uh, just traveling around, popular popularizing uh, philosophy. I uh, I sort of have a working hypothesis that uh, I think that all all people really find philosophy interesting, but some of them are just really uh, unlucky and fortunate to have uh, people presented to them uh, in a way that um, make it sound that it's not really about their lives, but it really is because it's it's about our space in the world, our our ability to to find meaning, to find happiness, to uh, to find truth, and so on. 
It's interesting that it's almost a relic in the academy at this point. Like we get doctors, like Anastasia and I worked in hard sciences, research, you know, technical research, but we're given as doctors. As hard of a science as you can call biology, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> we're given doctors of philosophy is my point, right? And then, you know, if you really trace this back, you find that the core of the original conceptions of the academy, say in ancient Greece or, or perhaps going uh, back even further, philosophy is a core pillar of the educational system at one point in time. And it seems to be there in namesake still, but it, but it's not taken as a serious art form as much. I mean, obviously philosophers think it, understand that it's a serious art form, but it's, you know, freshman incoming students who are trying to make their way in the world of business or of science or whatever. They're, they're not seeing it presented to them as if it is, uh, by and large, uh, an important piece of their toolkit. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. I guess our higher education is kind of, yeah, very much focused around utility. Actually, in Norway, I I don't know if you have it other places as well, but especially in Norway, you have all people that uh, enter into public uh, higher education needs to do uh, some credits in um, in philosophy. Hmm. We call it exfil. Uh, and many people protest because <laughs> they think it's just horrible because they they're studying teaching they're studying economics they're studying uh, to, to become a doctor so they they don't really see any reason why they should uh, teach about all of these uh, ancient people with uh, great beards saying silly stuffs about uh, uh, platonic forms and uh, all kind of stuff but I guess yeah that's 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 a relic that from the view that the higher education or well, the point of higher education was not to just to provide you some uh, uh, some special skill set, some utility that could be used for one specific purpose, but it was also to sort of, uh, yes, to to build your character, to provide you with the wisdom that's uh, required to navigate the world. I want to talk more about this, but I think that we should introduce the topic a little bit so yeah, that we yeah. have a good frame for the conversation, because I think that what you said is really interesting. And so about people who are listening like, kind of know where we're going with all of this, too. Yeah, exactly. So, Daniel, we found you. Is it is it Daniel? Is that the right way to pronounce it? Um, well, for uh, English speakers, it's probably the best one. It, how, how do you well, say it? I'm a Russian speaker, too. So Ah, yeah, I... Uh, well, my parents play, play the trick with all of us brothers. I, I'm the youngest of four brothers, and we all have double names, and we all use the second. So, I, yeah. uh, by friends, I, I'm, I'm really called uh, Joachim, but that's uh, we can do that. in Norwegian. We just say uh, uh, Joachim, but that's uh, pretty much harder for English speakers to pronounce. So, I, uh, with English speakers, I usually go by Daniel, but uh, you might choose. So, do you prefer Joachim or Joachim? Well, if you're comfortable with Joachim, then let's do it. Please. Joking. Okay. I mean, we're making you call us uh, Anastasia and Shiloh. So <laughs> if you can pull that off, <laughs> if you can handle that, we can handle Joachim. But yeah, why don't you set? Can you set the stage for how how we even found Joachim and how we even where we go from here? Technically, I feel like you have to do that because then I would be telling the story of how. Well, kind of. We're both in on this project together. I did find the article though, so I'll take credit for that. Okay. So you know, people who are listening to this podcast probably know that we've been working on this book for a while now, and we hope to get it out this year, where we're investigating the transition from physics being about mechanics to physics being about abstract mathematics purely, like the atom essentially being built out of math as opposed to the atom being built out of materials. And I was actually working on one of the closing chapters for that book recently, and I was looking for substantiation in the modern times of people... Uh, arguing about the difference between an explanation and a description. Because it's my sense that most people are completely confused about what the difference between a description and an explanation is. And I figured there would be a lot of people who had worked on this before. And I found some. I found a pretty good piece by Wittgenstein talking about this. Um, and I found your, and I found this Popular Science article that you had written. Um, I can't remember the news outlet that you wrote that for. But it was a, one of those moments when you're just out there at sea and you haven't seen a ship in days and you finally see a light on the horizon and you think wow somebody else is actually concerned about this same thing and i i felt a little less alone in the universe when i read your your article because this is something that's just come up over and over and over again on, on our program and sometimes you you talk about this with scientists and 
even philosophers, and they just give you this blank look like you're, what the hell are you talking about? Um, it's such a foreign dichotomy to most people that because, and, and I have a, I have my own theory for why that is, and we can play with that later. But you wrote this piece. It, the piece is essentially outlining the thesis, and please correct me if I don't nail this on the head, but that the laws of nature that we're so dutifully obsessed with producing in modern science, particularly physics, they capture the appearances of the phenomenon, but they don't actually explain the cause of the phenomenon. And in some sense, if we want to be maximally effective natural philosophers or, not, or scientists, science, you know, explainers of nature then we have to comprehend what an explanation truly looks like versus a mere retelling of the story using quantitative parameters. Uh, so that was the piece that uh, I really wanted to talk to you about. And you, you go through, of course, and lay out some different justifications for this position and the way that people have tried to solve it over the years. And maybe we can talk about those. But I also want to talk about some other alternative solutions and where you think how how could this be healed and what would that lead to? And so, yeah, there's, there's a lot on the table there for us to tear into, but maybe you can just restate uh, the thesis in your own words or, or correct wherever I've gone off the rails. Yeah, no, it was a, it was a great summary. Um, yeah. So, so really what we, what we speak of when you speak of the laws of nature, my argument is that, uh, well, we're, we're only talking really about the mathematical structure of the world. We are only abstracting certain aspects of the world, which is true as far as it goes, and uh, which is great for, for this new purpose that we want our, our, our new sciences to be, uh, namely the, the control and uh, predictive success of, uh, of, of the sciences that we can uh, utilize in uh, technology and, and so on. But sort of to, to capture what the world is in itself, it's, uh, well, it's, it's kind of lacking. And it's also kind of a mystery what what these uh, laws of nature really are because we well we use the term like it's just a uh, commonplace and it's just uh, it should just be obvious to anyone what uh, what we're referring to but i think uh, most people don't uh, really understand how uh, how increasingly uh, problematic the term in itself is so in the article i just uh, try to uh, yeah sketch uh, ske sketch five different approaches to what what is meant what is even meant by the by the laws of nature and uh, yeah, try to try to say some uh, some upsides and some downsides by with each of them. And it sounds like the core of the argument is that if you formalize a law of nature and you do not ask the question of what has caused the law that you have formalized, you haven't really done much except for find a pattern of some kind. Yeah, or another problem is just like, where do we locate the source of causal agency? Um, I think most people perhaps don't know that uh, the laws of nature was originally a theological term. That was kind of the only only way to, to make sense of uh, uh, what it could mean by still sort of preserving the causal uh, efficiency that um, was, was meant by the Aristotelian notion that it uh, overthrew. So... In the beginning, just using the words as a, a law of nature was really just a shorthand for, yeah, sort of a, a, a divine command. So you sort of, you preserve the causal agency by saying that, well, well, why why is gravity like this? Why is Kepler's laws like this? Why is electromagnetism like this? Well, it's just a shorthand to say that, uh, well, that's the way that God has pre preordained the world. But of course, now nowadays, we want to cut uh, God out of the picture. So then, it's, then we sort of had to... We sort of have to ask that. Well, what, where are we supposed to find the source of causal agency right now? How can we say that sort of uh, a law of nature, a, a law of nature do, does not only uh, describe sort of some kind of relations within the natural world, but sort of also explain it? It's 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 kind of responsible. It's it's almost doing it, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the hinge. I want to ask about Aristotle and the Church. Because getting rid of Aristotle is a really important moment in the development of natural philosophy and the eventual emergence of the sciences. Okay, before we get to Aristotle, I want to do that too. Do you think it's? I just want to make sure that this is this is really we're at this really interesting moment in this podcast where it's very possible that somebody might be blinking at the screen, being like, "What the hell are you talking about?" 
<laughs> I want to make sure that we give an example of this so that it becomes absolutely clear. And there's millions of them. Well, there's a really good example in the... I'm sorry. I'm, I'm like changing the screens right now and I, I changed the order of all of the buttons and so I changed it incorrectly. We'll edit that out though. We'll edit that out, sorry. You have this really good example in the article where you're like, okay, so Kepler's laws of motion. If you ask somebody like why the planets go around the sun the way that they do, they'll point you to Kepler's law of motion. And then when you're like, well, how did Kepler get to his law of motion? And then they're like, well, it's because the planets move around the sun. And so you never end up getting to ground truth. It's a circular definition by which the phenomenon gives rise to the law, but the law is formulated on the phenomenon, and you never actually get anywhere beyond the first order question of where this comes from. Which is perhaps worth putting in contrast to something like a mechanistic explanation. Which is like the uh, planets are held on tethers and as the, the, the sun spins around, depending on the length and tension of the tethers, the planets stay where they're supposed to be. Like, Which might be absurd for some other reason because, you know, you could say, well, we, don't, we haven't seen any tethers or whatever. <laughs> yeah. But at least, it has some, um, it, at least there's a mechanism involved there, right? I mean, uh, I was thinking something more just like the ATP synthase or something, you know, some biomechanical system where you actually can say that this thing is turning this way, it's clamping these atoms together, or these molecules together in a way that, that stores tension in their bonds and they can be used to do work later on. You could imagine a mechanistic explanation. But yeah, uh, the Earth being tied to the sun physically would certainly be a mechanism at, at least <laughs> right or wrong. So, th so anyway, so if everybody's listening, that's the basic idea on the table is like, just by parameterizing something, we, m we, we have done great service in, in an engineering department because we can now tweak those parameters and, and build tools to accommodate them. But do we actually understand the mechanics of the situation? Yeah. And I should just emphasize, um, well, first of all, the, the example with Kepler's laws is from the philosopher Edward Faser, so I, it's not my own. But also, it, sort of the point is, is Anytime you ask, well, well, why why does this happen? Even if, if it's uh, the elliptical orbits or or something else, uh, and you answer, well, 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 it's because of this law. <laughs> then sort of, what explanatory force uh, is that supposed to have? Is is like is there just like some abstract platonic form called Kepler's law that's sort of just interfering with the planets and uh, making it uh, move in a um, in a specific way? So, well, sort of the point is that often when we just use uh, Often when we say that, well, why does this national phenomena happen? And we answer that, well, it's because of this uh, natural law. It's really just a it's it's really just a way of naming. Um, of course, I have a fancy name for uh, for something that fits that description, but still, this sort of the causal efficiency is uh, remains wide open. You you haven't really uh, gotten any deeper in your uh, explanatory work. And I think we've been really able to sweep that under the rug for the last. I mean, let's say the age from the from the beginning of the age of reason. I feel like we've been gradually moving more. Almost as soon as we come up with the idea that it is our role to explain things mechanistically, we start to formulate laws of nature mathematically. And so, there's not really a time that you can point to in the history of the science where we spend a lot of time really focusing on the mechanics. Like I feel it, because, and I say that because you look at Newton, who's writing shortly after Descartes. Descartes is like, no, 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 everything is mechanistic. Newton's like, yeah, probably, but your mechanisms are shit. And here's the math <laughs> for how it actually works. And everybody's like, and, but, and then he's like, but I don't know how it works. And it's not our job. And it's not our job. And <laughs> things are really job. going chaotic in the uh, in the demystify side studio today. So he's like. Uh, you're wrong, Descartes. This is how it actually mathematically works out. Uh, I have no idea why it works out that way. We're not going to focus on that. And everybody after Newton is just kind of more or less happy to go along with that because it's really hard to come up with something that's a plausible mechanism. Yeah, and and, and still for people like Descartes and Newton, you still have a sort of a, you have the theological options still available to you as um, sort of covering that explanatory gap. But uh, later on, we... We sort of we, we continue to use the language, but we we sort of just forgot that there was a, an explanatory gap. So God did it, basically. <laughs> well, 
<laughs> well, that, that's yeah. yeah, some 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 force that's beyond our control. I often think about that too when I have the occasion to discuss with a biologist evolution. It's always striking to me how they use evolution like the hand of God, right? It's really you could literally substitute in the word God when people say evolution, and and you would be very close to understanding their presentation still because they're like these, you know, they treat it like this cosmic force that's doing that's an actor, an agentic actor that's doing stuff. And like, I know there's a lot of details to that. And there, there is a lot of value in the, the parameterization and the model and everything. But it still has that flavor of, you know, mysterious cosmic force that's acting out, which is not so far off from God. Well, and that's, I think that that's an interesting thing to tease apart, because I think that's basically what Platonism was as well. Like, it wasn't said as God exactly, right? It's the idea of there being the archetypal form that is in some other realm that mysteriously is able to cross that border between worlds and manifest the horse that is both platonically black and platonically horse. And so you have these mixtures of forms, but it seems very godly to me. Like it seems like that is the realm of gods. And after Plato kind of comes Aristotle, and Aristotle isn't particularly different because he has the, what is it, the sublunary and the, the superlunary realms that are also occupied by forms and corrupt version of the forms. And then you have the Christian church that comes along, and the Christian church is like, Aristotle works really well for us. And they, they kind of hang on to it for the next thousand years, more, 1,500 years-ish. And so it feels like that's just a massive question of like, where does this stuff come from that we've been trying to answer for 2000 years and haven't, we still haven't made it. Yeah. Well, this might be a bit off topic, but uh, yeah, Aristotelian thought was really just in, reintroduced in European thought. Uh, so, so I don't think that the Christian church was uh, dependent on Aristotle for uh, a thousand years because yeah, Islamic thinkers started translating and reintroducing uh, Aristotle to the European culture uh, around the year uh, 1100, 1200. So, yeah, I, I think that uh, Platonism even had an even larger influence on, uh, yeah, on on the culture closest to our own than uh, Aristotle, at least in the beginning. But, but yeah, you, you're correct that Aristotle had um, was the philosopher in the medieval ages. And so, he's the philosopher. But in the he was brought back by the Islamic scholars. There was like a period of time, like in the 1100s, where they started to translate large quantities of manuscripts from Arabic into, I think, Latin at the time. That yeah, from re- Greek to Arabic to Latin, yes. And so like it reintroduced a lot of these ideas that had been lost to Europe and had survived in the Islamic world that had like maintained connections to them. But so what's the... I know that, that Aristotle's philosophy is a really significant hinge point at the age of reason because Descartes is loudly saying that Aristotle is wrong like Gassendi at the same time is like this uh he's a priest who's high up in the ranks of the Catholic Church who's also starting to suggest that Aristotle is wrong you have Isaac wrong B- wrong in what way I, I think that it's the earliest inklings of this mechanistic philosophy, right? Like Descartes is basically like, we need to start thinking of objects in motion. And Aristotle is still like, we need to be thinking about forms and manifestations. Is that a fair division? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I sort of think that the, the shift introduced by Bacon and Descartes is... Um, just as much about sort of trying to uh, yeah trying to sort of abstract out the levels that's sort of uh, y- useful for the for their view of what the sciences should now be mainly the 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 control and pre- predictive ability of of, of the science uh, over nature so um, yeah I, I think that that's sort of why they introduced this new uh, mathematized uh, approach to science uh, in the late middle ages so yeah, i think it's it's not that um, Aristotle wasn't uh, concerned about the objects in motion. It was, uh, yeah, they, they they sort of have different ways to 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 describe it. While uh, 
Aristotle want to sort of study the uh, the inherent capacities of uh, projectiles to, uh, to to cause that motion. Um, yeah, the new thinker sort of looked at it a bit more from the outside and sort of wanted to measure uh, um, into mathematical models how we can uh, how we could calculate that motion. Can can you say more about the way that Aristotle is more interested in motion? Can you say more about what Aristotle was interested in when it came to motion? Like when you see studying projectiles, you say that he's studying them in a different way. Yeah. Um, well, you might know. I should also reveal that I'm I'm an Aristotelian myself, so I'm not uh, all objective uh, to this. But yeah, Aristotle sort of want to. Um, Aristotle is known for, for example, his uh, his uh, four causes that he want to sort of investigate uh, natural objects in uh, in the multiple levels. And uh, these new scientists, the they, they they saw that, for example, the the formal cause and the final cause was uh, was pretty much useless if you if you really just wanted to mathematize and uh, calculate how how projectiles uh, moved and uh, yeah put it into mathematical models. So. Um, in one way, I think we're sort of here seeing the introduction of the shift that we're uh, that we're really talking about from sort of uh, yeah formalizing things uh, from starting to formalize the things in in terms of laws of nature to really asking about well what causes this uh, where's the where should we locate the cause so, uh, the source of causal agency um, which was really uh, also a question that uh, Aristotle was more concerned about but uh, that was not very interesting when you were doing the stuff that. Uh, Descartes and Galileo and uh, yeah, Bacon wanted the new sciences to be about. Did he have any? Uh, did, did Aristotle have any hypotheses about the location of causal agency in these motions? You're, you're calling it final cause. Really quick, if you're listening to this podcast and you are enjoying it, consider coming over to Patreon.com. We support ourselves on the basis of these patron donations. It means that we never have to deal with advertisers, with sponsorships, with reading hokey messages about various things and tchotchkes that you should buy, and it means the world to us. So come over to patreon.com slash demystifysci. In the article, I, I sort of, uh, I sketched these five five different views about uh, the uh, what we call these forces of nature. And uh, I would say that, well, well, four of them have sort of the, um, kind of the problem that is it, it sort of, it places the the source of causal agency without the actors themselves. Uh, but what Aristotle wants to do is that well, why uh, why do these natural substances tend to to cause the things that they do? Well, it's because that they have causal dispositions within themselves, not because there's some there's some stuff out there that's sort of intervening. And uh, if it's uh, if it's God or if it's a uh, natural law or if it's a uh, Platonic form. Uh, it's not some immaterial thing that's sort of intervening into the natural world, but the the source of the causal uh, efficiency is uh, located within the, within the substances themselves. So the projectile so I, I, flies I, because there's something in the projectile that causes it to fly the way that it does. Like the feather flies not differently. Not in, but of and about. Yeah, like how do we how, how do we like tie that to the specific? Like, so he's got like a rock versus I don't know like a feather. Like, how would he explain the difference between the way that both of those fly through the air when you throw them? Yeah, well, well, well. Now we know Aristotelian physics to obviously to be wrong, so he got that uh, he got that severely wrong. But uh, the argument is that the Aristotle's physics can be sort of uh, unchained from this uh, from his uh, metaphysics, his uh, natural philosophy. So even though uh, sort of Aristotle lacked the uh, empirical models and the uh, the method to. Uh, to actually find out how, uh, yeah, how how these projectiles uh, act, and then still there's some um, there still are some upsides to sort of uh, how we want to describe the sort of yeah causal agency. Yeah, because I would say it's not too far off from from what's accurate, which is the, the all he needed to do was consider the actions of the other bodies in the presentation as well, not just the body itself, but how the the, these bodies conspire in order to produce the phenomenon. That wouldn't have been a huge leap if he's locating the cause of action in the in the bodies, at least. But I think that there's always been, as far as I understand it, a really big difficulty with dealing with the what they called like imponderable substances 
around the time of Faraday, which are like things that you can't see and touch and feel, yet which must be there. Like I think that in the beginning, electricity was an imponderable substance for Faraday because it was doing stuff. Well, I mean, air would have been one back in the time of Aristotle, right? Yeah, it's like there's have... just stuff and it's empty and yet... There's effects there's mediated effects. across the void. And so how do you come to a theory that includes the distance between objects as being part of cause, I guess. I, I, I just, it seems, it seems like a we difficult cognitive leap new, to make. You have to hypothesize tiny little bodies called atoms, I guess, that make up the air that are affecting he, the action. Okay, so, so he, something you can't possibly see, but you know it must be there. Okay, so this is, I think that there's a huge conflict between Aristotle and Democritus, right? Like, didn't Plato and Aristotle burn a bunch of Democritus's work? <laughs> <laughs> well, you you you're probably more uh, you're probably more knowledgeable about that uh, that than me. Yeah, and so like Democritus is the guy who's like, okay, so I think that there's I think that there's atoms and not forms, and as far as I can tell, Plato and Aristotle hated him. Why? Because he was like, there's not forms, there's atoms. He's like, there's there the final cause is here locally. It's not from somewhere else. There's no other realm. There's sounds... just this place. And that was, like, that's a key aspect of Platonism and Aristotelianism, as far as I can tell, is but that there a... is another realm. But it sounds like what Joachim's saying is that Aristotle was trying to locate the cause in the bodies. But the bodies themselves were generated by influence from another realm. Is that, is that accurate or no? That's how I've always written about what do you mean by another realm? Well, there's like the sublunary realm and the superlunary realm, which is like the immortal, uh, idealistic realm and then the corrupted terrestrial realm. And so like the, the properties of the ball come from the other realm. Uh, no, I wouldn't think that is, that is accurate because, yeah, Aristotle is sort of known for in one sense, naturalizing Plato by saying that, well, it's it's kind of superfluous to sort of postulate this uh, this third realm, and he was uh, he was taking this uh, this uh, yeah, what, what, sort of what Plato called forms, this uh, these properties, this uh, well, wh why why do we experience a blue a blue ball as a blue? Yeah, because it has a uh, because of the f the form of blueness, would Plato say that resides in some some faraway place? But uh, Aristotle would say that, well, we we don't have to postulate a a faraway place; we can just say that the form of the form of blueness is sort of uh, inside of the the blue ball itself. So it's it, it is it is in at the same time something real, but it's also not something. Yeah, we, we sort of we, we don't have to postulate this for for a realm to make sense of it. Interesting. I I'm gonna I'm gonna look this up. You're really having quick. your uh, your Aristotelian. Uh, oh yeah, I uh, had like a whole model of Aristotle that included this, yeah. and I, I could be totally well, wrong. Yeah. Well, well, you talk about the Democritus and the atomic theory, and of course, when we when we teach about this in school today, we think that well, <laughs> he was a genius because he 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 kind of foresaw what uh, we would discover uh, some thousands of years uh, afterwards. But of course, what uh, what we don't uh, usually don't tell is that his atomic theory was uh, well very different from the uh, from the modern atomic theory. For example, Democritus sort of have to postulate that. Well, how how do you account for the multiplicity of the world? How do you account for the existence of both? Uh, of both uh, planets and elephants and uh, blue balls and uh, yeah, all, all the kind of stuff that there is. Well, he he sort of have to say that. Well, but that's because there are atoms in uh, every shape and form. So that's um, yeah. It's in one sense it's a it's a very messy metaphys metaphysics because it's uh, it needs lots of stuff. Yeah, not definitely. much of his original. I don't think any of his original writings survived. I think it's all recounted by subsequent historians and philosophers. Yeah, and that's also sort of why we should be a bit skeptical to how we read ancient philosophy, because uh, oftentimes uh, uh, pre previous philosophers are retold by uh, by uh, by newer philosophers that are critical of them. And uh, well, if you if <laughs> you just have to follow the contemporary uh, philosophical debates, uh, just noticing that uh, other philosophers are not always uh, very accu accurately <laughs> redescribed by other philosophers, especially those who are critical of them. <laughs> That's definitely it is true. interesting to me. This is something I keep coming across: is that this idea of atomism was at least um, uh, it was at least 
an idea of intrigue by the time of the Romans. Because, you know, one of my favorite Roman uh, philosophers is Marcus Aurelius. And I'll, I'll periodically read meditations because it's just such a, it's such a good way to start the day. It's like read a little bit of meditations, you know. I mean, here's this guy who's just completely at the top of the world. And he's just trying to figure out how to be a better person. And how to wrestle with like the impossible, the impossibility of existence, you know, all this empire that you build is you're still going to die. Like, and it's mm. so anyways, um, what I came across is that even Aurelius at several points, well, at, I think, I don't know how many, but he mentions atomism a few times in, in meditations as if it's kind of a curiosity. But what's really fascinating is that it seems to, as an idea, just vaporized from the face of the earth for the next thousand years after that. And that's a really, that, that dark window is really, really fascinating to me because it seems like I don't understand what caused people to move away from this idea for so long. And Anastasia was, ha, has this model that it was because the Christian church had embraced uh, this Platonism. I, specifically, I was saying that it's Aristotelianism and because of this like super lunary and sublunary world where I looked it up and he doesn't use the, you're right that he doesn't use the idea of the forms in the same way that Plato does, but he still has an ideal realm that is incorruptible, that is like made of unique substance. And then you have all of the like earth, air, fire, water, that's terrestrial, and those two realms are separated. And that maps really neatly onto Christian cosmology, which is that you have the terrestrial realm and you have heaven, and then down below you have hell. And so it just seemed like, a, I think, a very powerful idea that was already popular that could be folded into the Christian cosmology once it became a state religion. Well, I, I say that, well... I don't think even Christians would uh, sort of divide the world in that way. They they don't believe in the. Um, I don't think, yeah, they don't they don't believe in sort of the terrestrial realm and heaven. They they believe that though. Well, heaven is sort of the, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's the perfection of the terrestrial world. It's uh, it's uh, yeah, it's 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 a new creation, but it's not an another creation. So so heaven, well, as the song says, that heaven is a place on earth. So, uh, he actually wrote that about a gay bar in Manchester called Heaven. Excuse me. Oh, that's a t it's a Talking yeah. Heads song, <laughs> yeah. right? He wrote it about a gay bar in Manchester. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I agree. That's definitely the most charitable interpretation of Christian theology. But you must admit that when the church and the state were the same entity, there was a great deal of of mythology layered on top of that basic principle that got into the realm of different worlds and different levels of of rule by gods and sub gods and angels and all this stuff right i mean they had it divided up quite uh what's the word i just i i, I meet a lot of people that are biblical Strictly. literalists to this day where they're like there's a guy in a yep, seat yep. in a place and you're like really and they're like yeah absolutely there's a guy in a seat in a place where i will go when i die like pulling strings on people like very it's, it seems I, like, a lot I, like this. Uh, it's it's not a philosophical platonic. construction. It literally is this other realm to which you ascend when you are freed from the body. And like I think that that's probably a pretty old conception. I I don't actually know when the idea of like the man God in the sky became the. Yeah. Well, I <laughs> I don't want to insult anyone, but uh, yeah, it seems like that's. Uh, Kind of more in a, of an American experience. I was gonna say that oh, might it totally <laughs> is. It <Yeah>. Totally is. <laughs> but it's still an experience. Like it's yeah. it's a it's a it's a destate. I like. Well, I think it's present in the East too. To be fair, we've been watching a bunch of these like cult documentaries lately, and and there's some Asian cults that are also Christian in that sense. And and I don't know. There it it, it crops up here and there. Like the Moonies a little bit. A little is that bit, what you're yeah, thinking of? Yeah. And I'll, I mean also just I guess West Western American. Uh, missionaries have, of course, colonized a large portion of Africa and, and you know, the island nations and so it's forth. It's definitely the Hollywood version of Christianity. Like, if there was one, this would be the Hollywood version of it, where there's, you know, these, like, massive characters and... 
That's really interesting, though, that you say that that's just not prevalent. That's so interesting. I, I can't imagine what that must be like, actually. <laughs> yeah, but, but also when you study philosophy of history, of course, uh, at least prior to modern ages, most of them were theists. They were, uh, they were Greeks. Uh, uh, Aristotle was a theist. Uh, they were uh, Christians. They were Jews. They were Muslims. And uh, yeah, none of them envisaged God as like a, like a man in the sky located somewhere uh, in a distant uh, lunar uh, realm. But yeah, they, they, perhaps they, again, that would take us off topic, but they have a more sophisticated, more sophisticated ways of speaking about God than, than that. But of course, the God is something sort of unspeakable. So we have, uh, we have our artistic renditions of God, and then sometimes he is portrayed as a, as a, yeah, as a man, or um, is, as in uh, Michelangelo's picture, like uh, a hand stretching out. But uh, yeah, I, I don't think that, were ever, that was ever meant to be taken uh, literally. But yeah, as, as you say, there are, there are probably people that believe it. We're well, not, we're not. By who? In, in, you know, that's in, what it comes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, in the same way that there are people believing anything. Well, it's, I was it's just going to say we're not known for subtlety. Sorry. I was going to say we're not known for subtlety in America. No, we're not. <laughs> but also, if you're a state religion, it seems very useful that you would have people believing that there's a guy in the sky who's pulling strings and so forth. And he's on our team, right? And it just seems like a very technologically productive way of approaching God for, for a state. I, I could just, I wonder how much of that has come into the fold here. Yeah. I, so well, history is a messy. There's always a mix of uh, of power and politics and philosophy and trying to find truth. So I'm like, there's this tangling of the idea of God always throughout history in our attempts to explain how stuff works. Because you get to the bottom of stuff, and everybody's a theist. There's some celestial, untouchable, unreachable realm that we can never understand, and so. When you start to ask these questions about final cause, it's really easy to just like shove everything off into the pit of God, whatever form that takes. And I think that the transition that happened to us over the course of the last f hundred and fifty years or so is we were like, we're really old. <laughs> yeah, specifically. <that. laughs> yeah, it, it sounded like you were sort of explaining that uh, you were there. So, <laughs> I mean, I like you remembering when. <laughs> yeah, uh, I feel like it was. She, I... she looks good for her age, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, we like God died, right? Like we could kind of all agree on that. That everybody became too smart to believe in God, and so we're like, because you even said the yourself, the pie in the sky, God, for sure. I, I think generally, if you look at surveys now, the fraction of people that report none as to their religious affiliation is going up and up and up every year. Like people have gotten to the point where they don't even have this sense of. I think it's still in the majority of people who do, though, even in America. We can look this up, yeah. but my point is this: is that the need for theism is actually really inherently important to humans and so when you're like we're going to do science now instead of religion you haven't actually gotten rid of their need for theism you've just put it into mathematics again it's basically like pythagorean mystics being like holy shit these numbers when you arrange this number of stones they make a triangle and they're like, that must be really significant. And now we have like tensor calculus. And we're like, that's really significant. And it's, it's, the, it's the same thing, but just dressed in mathematics. Yeah. Um, well, perhaps I can talk about that in a way that sort of uh, gets us back on topic. <laughs> because I think that, well... Again, we're talking about what what, it re what is really a law of nature. But in one sense, we're, we're talking about the question, well, what is ultimate reality? And of course, uh, you have uh, popular scientists saying that, well, uh, ultimate reality is, is the laws of nature. It's um, a matter working, uh, working in, in accordance with the, with the laws of nature. And right now, there's, it's kind of messy because there are lots of laws out there. But uh, if we're fortunate, then, uh, then finally, we're, we're going to integrate everything into one big law of everything. And that will sort of, uh, yeah, be be the bedrock of, of reality. Uh, and of course, yeah, but uh, yeah, and <laughs> so that's sort of one view of, of the world. And of course, if 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 bedrock of reality is the is the laws of nature and the uh, matter working in accordance with it, then there's no room for theism. 
but the other view is sort of that uh, well ultimate reality is uh, is god uh, it's uh, it's the logos and sort of all all the natural world sort of uh, springs from springs from that ultimate reality and uh, yeah again what we call what we even call the laws of nature sort of uh it's 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 uh, downstream of that uh, that kind of reality so i i, uh, I really don't like sort of the uh, dichotomy between uh, science and religion but i think it's uh, it's kind of different views about what is ultimate reality and um, it's also kind of uh, which one of those views are best compatible with the ability to do science at all because yeah science science uh, has lots of prerequisites it's it's not like uh, science is uh, some just some uh, neutral activity that we can all do without doing having any pres presuppositions at all we have to uh, presupp presuppose uh, things like uh, the universe, the universe being orderly, uh, you have to presuppose things that uh, you, uh, human beings uh, being the kind of beings that sort of have the cognitive capacity and 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 then sensory capacity to actually uh, reach out into the world and make sense of it. Uh, perhaps even in accordance with uh, mathematical tools. And again, what what are these mathematical tools? They seem like they're just a, a immaterial, abstract object. So yeah, there are a wide range of questions that are very very interesting. And, and sorry if I if I drew the topic uh, away from what you, uh, yeah, the the direction where you were headed. No, I don't. I don't think you did because I'm like I think that the math is God. In the modern sense. Yeah, like I think that the math is the replacement for supernatural cause. Mm -hmm. I think that that's the the that need for, uh, for final cause has never gone away. And it's really hard to figure out final cause. And yeah. the math allows you to say that we understand the dynamics of events. And if the dynamics, if the description of the dynamics is so uniform that it can always be slotted in into all these different systems, then it's enough. And so the dynamics themselves are the source of everything that we see. That's basically like what quantum field theory is saying, right? It's like there's a moving vector field that you're measuring, and that's just it. It's just this like moving vector. And you're like, well, what's the what's moving? And they're like, the vector. And you're like, yeah, but like usually we attribute that to like a thing that's moving, right? And they're like, no, 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 here it's just a vector. <laughs> and you're like, well, how do you make shit out of vectors? And they're like, well, that's a stupid question. But I don't think it is, right? Because I think that this is what you're trying what you're driving at. Yeah, and, and the mathematics have sort of the famous property that they are really partially inert. So at least the ancient view about uh, God or gods and spirits or whatever sort of have the had the advantage that at least you could sort of attribute some sort of uh, yes, yeah, some sort of causal efficiency, some prime mover uh, property to them. But uh, yeah, if you if you if you really want to place mathematics at the at the rock bottom, you sort of have to yeah bridge the gap between mathematics and the world. Um, at, at least if you yeah to, to, to move to move from the space of math, mathematics being cautiously inert to sort of saying that well how how can they influence or yeah uh, how you want to frame it and I guess it was like really shocking to me that this isn't how science was done at, at all scales like that that's kind of why this became interesting to me is you know for my most recent academic work, I started with a mathematical law that I gave to fit the curve of some experimental data. And by examining the law, I noticed that something was really interesting. And then my job was to explain how the experimental system was producing this interesting anomaly right? And, and how it, the law could be used to explain what the material actors were doing inside of my experimental physical system. So, I kind of figured that this is just how all of science is done. Until I started studying fundamental physics and quantum field theory and some of the edges of questions like, what is charge? What is magnetism? What are these, are these invisible forces actually representing? And I was essentially told by every source that I could find. And I went to the ends of the earth to, to ask these questions. I tracked down all of my most esteemed physicists who'd written all the books that I, I was, that, the ones that were still alive. 
And I, I was essentially told that those were just not problems for physics. Those were, those were not, not our problems. The philosophers can argue about those. <laughs> and I was surprised to find the philosophers weren't necessarily arguing about them as much as I hoped they had. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess in, in, in one sense, the physicists are right. If, uh, it, it, it sort of all depends on what is your purpose. If, if, if your purpose is like doing some calculations to find, about, find out about this phenomenon, then you don't, you don't have to think about what, what is supposed to be behind this thing that I called law. But uh, yeah, when you're, when you're a philosopher and you want to sort of delve into the philosophy of nature, then that suddenly becomes a problem. But I, I, I think it's a good thing that, <laughs> that not all scientists have to think about this kind of stuff because then, uh, yeah, then uh, our uh, scientific advancement would, uh, would probably come to a halt. Well, our technological advancement certainly would, that's for sure. I, I just don't think that you need to know the answer to these questions. To, obviously, we're sitting here talking across thousands of miles by Zoom using mathematically engineered devices that gave zero shits about what an electron actually looked like or what you know charge actually physically represents. But they can manipulate charge all day long because they have the force laws to do so. And they can engineer to no end, it seems like, without actually comprehending the physical mechanisms that underpin them. And so, yeah, if everybody stopped working on, on the parameterization, then it, it'd probably be bad news. But then again, I, I think that sometimes when we make a physical revelation about a system, like a great example is heat. Um, you know, we used to think of heat as just this like fluid that was flowing around, some sort of magical fluid that was flowing around inside of bodies until quite recently, until the advancement was made, really uh, uh, subsuming the concept of atomism, that actually heat was just the motion of these, these atoms. I think that you can make pretty large leaps in your, your understanding in other technological realms once you have this reframing and you actually give it a, a material basis. Like, Anastasia's got this really good example she came up with where she's like, look, what if people had started studying genetics before they had any, well, they did start, let's say they continued to study genetics into modern age and made all sorts of statistical advancements in terms of how genes are inherited. I but instead of recognizing that there was a genetic crystal called DNA that was responsible for encoding the information, and that physical changes to the DNA resulted in the downstream changes and processing and all of this. What if instead they just packaged it as a bunch of fields? There were genetic fields in the center of the cell, and the fields were responsible for interacting with one another and multiplying and mutating. And the fields, which could be described very accurately by equations, were what were responsible for all of the biological behaviors. Would we have stumbled across a technology like CRISPR-Cas if we were thinking about it in terms of fields? I don't know. Maybe not. So in some sense, maybe it does hold us back technologically to be completely abstracted at our fundamental scale. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> again, that's a very good point. But um, yeah, um, but again, bringing us back to sort of what, what does these, these kind of things mean? Um, they say, well, with the with the genetics, I, I think there's a famous quote. Uh, there's a famous quote I I think is Erwin Schrödinger. He says something that well, if uh, if uh, Nobel prizes could be given posthumously, we should really have given one to Aristotle because of his uh, discovery of the principle that goes into the DNA. Because again, if uh, if if you're trying to explain a DNA, then what is in was it? What is it in sort of the capacity of a DNA that's sort of directed towards producing one type of being with all of its uh, subsequent capacities? Um, yeah, what's what, what's sort of the best way of framing it? Is it mechanistically, or is it actually in the Aristotelian form uh, of uh, formal and final causes that there's sort of a, there's sort of an inherent directedness uh, in this biological realm? So yeah, I I I agree with what you say that. Um, I think there are there are sometimes when sort of technological advancement is uh, is the best best done at a very abstract level. But uh, again, if we if we want to sort of try try to explain uh, sort of the, the the capacities that lies beneath them, then it's uh, it's sometimes a good thing to sort of be able to zoom out and uh, yeah, again talk about what what are the natures of these things and what's sort of driving them towards their goals and and so on.
Like in the sense that if you are going to sit down and try to explain the first cause of, let's say, a cell, you first have to understand what life is and how it emerges. And when you boil it down, it has to come down to will. Is that kind of what you're suggesting? I'm not sure I I understand. Um, well, we probably <laughs> it's it, it's yes, I understand. It's 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 very hard to sort of understand what life is. Um, well, I've been sharing it and dedicate a, a whole book on book upon it. So, yeah, I mean, I guess what I what I'm trying to say is, you you said something about motivation as being primary first cause and inherent motivation, and so you're you're pointing to Aristotle and you're saying that Aristotle saw this thing inside of life, which was that it had this will to be something, and so even before we see DNA. He's already proposed the idea that there's something inside of life that forces that. DNA is a mechanistic explanation for that, but at the end of the day, a crystal structure for DNA is not an explanation for why that structure gives you a cell that wants to do stuff and evolves. Is, am, I, am I understanding you correctly? Well, you're talking about the will. So Aristotle obviously wants to attribute this uh, all over, not just the organic uh, realm, but also the inorganic realm. So... Of course, when we talk about wills, we we sort of uh, we envisage uh, conscious wills. Uh, it's yeah, but it's more like sort of a, a directiveness, a causal disposition towards uh, towards an end. That sort of uh, well, the purpose of that is sort of to try to make sense. Why why is it that uh, why is it that uh, that a match can produce fire? Because there's a causal disposition within the uh, chemical substances that. Uh, that, that make up this uh, this match, and um, yeah, all, also all throughout uh, evolution and and in in the DNA. Why why is it that sort of the the, the this kind of DNA is sort of directed towards producing a a creature of of, of this kind? Well, because there's some there's some causal dispos disposition already inherent in the in the DNA that's sort of uh, directed towards uh, the fulfillment of that being. And that causal disposition seems to come down to the way that it's structured. Yeah, that is is something. Yeah, it's something that sort of flows from 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 what it is. So you can you can sort of study what it is, and you can also say something about well, what is it directed towards? You can sort of well, just use some very basic examples. You can uh, you can study a squirrel, and you can say sort of say something about um, well, what it is <laughs> from from its uh, from its very structure and from its very nature. So you can say that well. It would probably be a good thing for for a squirrel. It's it's sort of directed towards uh, yeah being free, climbing trees, uh, eating nuts, and so on. So that's uh, yeah that's that's sort of leads to the to the thriving and the flourishing of that squirrel. Um, yeah, and in the in in the same way, you can sort of see uh, you can investigate a plant and see that well how how is it uh, how is it made up how is it structured, and you can see that well then this plant is doing uh, uh, photosynthesis. So. It would thrive. It would. It would flourish. It would. Uh, if you sort of you, if you provide the right con conditions for it, if you if you give it sunlight, if you give it sunlight, if you give it uh, clean water, then it's sort of directed towards that kind of thing. And you can also say that well, if you just uh, place it in the basement and give it say whiskey instead of pure pure water, then it would probably, yeah, that would probably work uh, contrary to sort of its uh, its inherent directedness. Uh, so, gets really rowdy. Yeah, <laughs> parties all the time. <laughs> stays up late. Uh, it sounds like this is directed towards also being able to kind of shift and direct the behavior of beings, right? Because it's if you understand the squirrel and you're like, the squirrel likes to do to collect acorns and uh, swing from trees. And you need the squirrel to do something. And you're like, okay, so... Like be your dinner? I wasn't <laughs> thinking about that. I was actually thinking of like uh, putting it to work in the factory or something. Okay, so and you know I how to motivate the squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> or you know where to find it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, where I'm like, you need it to run like a really tiny machine. And you're like, it does, it does a similar motion to running the machine when I give it acorns. And so I'm going to give it acorns. And that way I can direct its will towards running the machine. Yeah, and we're, we're. I know I'm making some huge leaps right now, but uh, right. yeah. In, in short, this is sort of the Aristotelian um, way of trying to uh, trying to save the problem of the 
of, uh, of the source of causal efficiency by saying that there's not something out there, it's something just inherent to substances uh, themselves. So, so you, you, yeah, you, you can't explain the, the behavior of the DNA or the, the behavior of the squirrel by just reframing it in some, some form of uh, uh, mathematical models, but uh, you sort of have to, you have to you look at the substance and its final cause as well. And I can also add that what, what made me interested in this in, in the first place, which we talked about in the, previously to this uh, recording, was I, uh, that I tried to make sense of the human mind and sort of the human will. Because if, if, if all you have is this mathematized uh, view of the world where, um, where you only sort of study the, the, the structure of the world and where you sort of have to, uh, uh, you just have to sort of delve down into the very uh, quantitative level, then uh, there, th there's no room, not just for human will, but not for human reason either. Because if you if you if you if you team up this uh, this uh, mathematized uh, structure of the world with uh, uh, with the theory of the laws of nature, sort of just governing everything from the outside, then uh, yeah, the world is uh, deterministic one one way or the other, and uh, the the things that are happening in your head is not uh, they're not essentially different from what, from what's happening. Yeah, when a, when a rock falls down a mountain. And of course, a rock falling down the mountain is not intelligent; it's not rational. So, if 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 what's if what's happening there is uh, the, the same thing that's happening in my head when I when I try to contemplate that, well, I I wonder if uh, Socrates is really mortal, given the premises that he's uh, he, that he's a human being and that all, all human beings are mortal. So, if I kind of sort of save a worldview that uh, enables me to save uh, save room for those kind of uh, uh, logical thoughts, then that was. Pretty much be self undermining, and um, yeah, and I I also been thinking a, a lot about the about the freedom of the will, and of course how how people often want to sort of reject that we have any freedom of will uh, nowadays. Uh, uh, say say with the Benjamin Lebe uh, experiments uh, and everything, and they're sort of trying to say that well, if you're going to have freedom, if you're going to have freedom, we need to we sort of need to put. Uh, electrodes on you and sort of try to find that uh, find the location of <laughs> that minuscule level where your sort of where your will is initiated because we're we're used to thinking at the quantitative level and if you if you're trying to sort of find find will at the quantitative level which i think goes all the way back to descartes uh, because when he had mathematized the world and he couldn't find any place for mining it because uh, mine is not quantitative it's qualitative so he sort of had to connect. He he had to put the mind outside of the world, make it Im immaterial, and just connect it with, to the world through a very minuscule part of the brain called, um, I think the English uh, word is some something like the spinal gland. Oh, the pineal gland, uh, I think. Uh, pineal gland. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Oh. So if if you're sort of investigating world and only operating at that uh, quantitative level, then uh, you, you're not going to save human reason. You're not going to save human will because what we want to say is that the the human being as an integrative whole. Not at a quantitative level, but human being as a as a unique substance over and beyond all of these uh, all of these fundamental particles or quantum fields uh, making up uh, making up my body. Uh, that uh, a, a human being is sort of something that appears and uh, is a substance that appears uh, over and above uh, my constituents. Then then that's as something that can sort of initiate the uh, causal change and. Uh, and I can find that uh, well. I, I I want to see how fast this uh, squirrel can travel. So I I I initiate a chain of uh, uh, chain of causal uh, activity that sort of had the final cause that I want to investigate what uh, what happens to this squirrel when I place it in. Uh, yeah, when I make it run with. Uh, yeah. We had this really relevant conversation when we were in the woods yesterday, where we were thinking about the nature of the human spirit and the various confirmations that it can take. Spirit just being synonymous with behavioral pattern or something like that. Yeah, like we were... Um, just to keep it clinical. Yeah, just, just, to, <laughs> just to keep it demystical. Um, you're Americans, you're supposed to be superstitious. <laughs> I'll add that to my list. Um, we were in the woods, and uh, there was this log, and the the log broke. It, like Shiloh was 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 standing on the log, and the log broke open, and it's full of termites. 
And the termites are terrified to be outside. And you can tell that each individual termite is is horrified at this development. And like they can't quite figure out how to get back inside. And so they're just kind of like teeming on the on the surface of this log. And we started thinking about the nature of a colony organism and the sort of spirit tendency, behavior, action, will, whatever you want to describe it, that must live inside of each termite that causes them to be termites and not like beetles. Do you know, does that make sense? And like the difference between termite and beetle is that a really long time ago, some common ancestor diverged in their ten- in in their spiritual tendencies. Like one decided that it was going to move- clinically speaking behavioral <laughs> tendencies. <laughs> culturally, <laughs> their cultural tendencies. Culturally, yes, I like that. It's just it's so impossible to talk about this stuff without at least a little bit of like it's kind of mystical if you think about it. Like once there was one type of bug and then that bug decided to go in two different directions and then you get termites and you get butterflies. Like if you go back far enough, that is actually our evolutionary story. And something inherent must have been inside of that bug where it contained two, two natures that it could choose between. And over the course of all of these iterations, it drove itself to termite or it drove itself to beetle or butterfly. And the Darwinian idea would be that, that the ecosystem forced it into choosing the termite spirit, essentially. Yes, and then to tie it back to the human mind, like, I feel like we within us contain multitudes. Like, we contain all of these different spirits. Like, some people have more of the, like, the... We certainly have the ability to be possessed by them. (laughs) Yeah, like, you can be possessed by the colony insect spirit. Well, like, just to be fair, like, we were talking about how these ancient, the ancient Greeks and so forth, they weren't just these superstitious idiots and how their, their conception of God wasn't as simplistic as a guy in the sky. We were talking about this earlier. And I think it's, it's a really important point because the way that they set up their pantheon was in some sense trying to capture these aspects of the human spirit, right? Like, they have gods, like the god of rage and the god of lust. You know, we have Venus and actually these are, uh, well, the Romans kind of took on the, the Greek uh, versions. But anyways, that we have these subroutines that are available to us, these autonomous programs that can kind of take over in this Jungian sense. That seems to be playing out for animals to a more restricted sense. It's like they don't necessarily have the will to choose between all of these different spirits at any given time, whereas humans have the ability to use their mind to choose hmm. which one of these programs they're going to... Like, I can somebody can piss me off and I cannot react if I, if I have control over myself. And I don't know that animals have that ability so much. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really very interesting. So I, I think you can hold these two ideas together, that uh, there, there's very much animal in us uh, human beings. And um, yeah, there, there's a tendency that this, these different kind of animals uh, tends to act in accordance with the uh, different kind of natures. But I think there's also something specifically, uniquely, y- unique in human beings. And I think that's, uh, that's kind of evidenced just by us sitting here having this, uh, having this talk. I, for example, I have a dog, I have a golden retriever, and he's, uh, he's wonderful. He's, uh, he's so cute and he's uh, intelligent in some ways, but not others. But uh, he, would never, he, would, he would never even think about the idea of setting up a pod- podcast and inviting people from <laughs> other parts of the world to... Uh, yeah, to talk about the the, the big ideas, what the, what is really ultimate reality, what are the laws of nature, and, and and so on. So I think there's really something there's really something unique about human beings that, of course, we uh, we act in accordance with our nature, but we also have this, um, and this brings brings me into the field that's sort of really my interest, the philosophy of mind. We we sort of also have this ability for metacognition. We can not only act in a way, but we can sort of also reflect uh, reflect on why do we act in a way and sort of, uh, yeah, even we can sort of even redirect uh, ourselves. I think that uh, one really interesting thing that's happening in our day and age is sort of how neuroscience is rediscovering, uh, in a sense, uh, some insights from uh, Aristotelian virtue ethics in terms of uh, neuroplasticity plasticity yeah and that can really just be uh, summarized as daniel hebd uh, Heb did by uh, uh, neurons firing together wired together so if you if you sort of just look at our mind like uh, uh, 
like uh, like the woods, like a forest that you like to go into, then th then there's probably some pathways that you that you like to go. And uh, of course, the more times you go along those pathways, then the easier it will become because the uh, vegetation is. Uh, yeah, you, you're walking down the vegetation, uh, and the other the other places of the woods where you don't walk as often, uh, they will grow together. So they will all, almost be impossible to access. Uh, uh, to access, so we can sort of have. We don't only have these immediate this desires. That says, say if I'm hungry, and uh, my immediate desire is to have fast food because uh, that would really taste uh, great right now. But I also have this uh, like. Uh, I thought you guys this, didn't uh, have order. fast food. <laughs> I thought that was an American thing. Yeah, we we've imported it from uh, from yourself. So thank you. For, You're welcome. Uh, McDonald's and Burger King and everything. That's uh, like exotic foods from afar. <laughs> that's uh, very beneficial to a large number of Norwegians. <laughs> yeah, but I cannot. Not only do I have have this desire for immediate fast food, but I also have this uh, second order desire to be, uh, say, a healthy person or to work out because I want to run a marathon in uh, in, in in three months. So I can sort of read a redirect myself and along with this uh, knowledge about neuroplasticity that um, really the, the the neural networks in the in the brain is uh, highly flexible they're rewirable and not only not only when you're a child not only uh, in your um, when you're a teenager but all throughout life so you can really rewire yourself in uh, in amazing ways and uh, yeah that's that's basically the sort of the aristotelian uh, focus on uh, having good habits uh yeah so 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 yeah, so you don't you don't only have these desires that I believe that uh, different kind of animals have, but you can also have the kind of desires about what you want to desire. Um, yeah, I, I know that I I want fast food right now, but I I don't want to be that kind of person. I want to be that kind of person that wants to be healthy, that wants to uh, that wants to work out, and that can join my friends when they're traveling in the woods and um, uh, don't slow them down and and everything. And I can sort of rewire myself and my own desires uh, in accordance with that. So I, I think that's kind of a very interesting uniqueness about the, the human capacity. Do you? Th this I agree. is a little bit on left field, but do you think that reason is capable of a right? Like, is it possible to rationalize your way to a proper code of conduct in, in the spirit of the Greek ethical philosopher, the Roman ethical philosophers, and so forth? Do you think that it's possible? Because in the absence of superstition, at least at the western edge of the west here in america it seems like there's a stark division unlike in in your country where superstition is the realm of moral of moral code of conduct right religion and superstition go hand in hand out here whereas there's no unified <laughs> moral language. code outside of religion where in this country it's it, i i mean that's a bold uh, statement but i don't know i mean that's in terms a, that's of like a, that's how a, to how to treat people? Yeah, I think that there's pretty there's pretty strict atheistic. Codes how to treat yourself? How to treat your body? How, is there's, there a unified moral code of conduct in the absence of that? No, but I mean, like, it's no less unified than say the difference in Buddhism, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, and like a collection of religions. There's like That's, a collection of religions that all have their code of conduct, and it's like within the tribe, everybody's unified about like this is the way we do things. I think it's very tribal. Like, I don't think that there's like a single monolithic perspective. But like, what what's the what's the the heart of of the point you're trying to make? Because I think it's a valid point. Is it possible for us to reason our way as a species? This is a big question, but do you think it's possible for us to agree on a moral framework for our place in the cosmos and our who we should be and which one of those spirits should possess us at any given moment? Is it possible to reason the way to a solution to that? Or will people always be divided in this kind of moral relativism where, you know, what I think is good is good. And, you know, it's all a simulation anyway, so who cares? <laughs> well, now you're taking us into the realm of metaethics, <laughs> another huge uh, topic, a very interesting topic. Yeah, what the. Uh, how do we drive big society towards uh, better goals? Uh, surely, at the, an in individual level, I, I, I think it's possible, as you, as you say, to sort of rewire yourself into perhaps not the, the perfect code of conduct, but because we're still weak, we're still affected by uh, conflicting natures, and uh, we don't live up to our our, uh, our ideals. Obviously, even though we can sort of 
try to work out, try to train ourselves like an athlete, trying to live a be better moral life. And uh, we can sort of try to re rewire our brain to make it easier for us to, um, to say, spend our income on, uh, on, on charity rather than ourselves. So at, um, at an individual level, I, I think it's really possible. At least if you sort of, if you have a, um, if you, you have the will, line, if, <laughs> yeah, well, if you have a good enough reason, if you, if you, be, if you really believe that these, uh, these ideals are sort of worth living after at a, at a, at a large level, I think that's, this is kind of cliche, but I think, uh, I think society needs some stories to live after. Um, because we we all want to be a part of a a part of a bigger story, and obviously religion gives that. So, is there any hope in the absence of religion uh, trying to come together around some 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 story? Is yeah, it? And, that's, and, that's and one that's not tyrannical too, right? Like, I mean, there's stories. There are popular mythologies today, right? Like, and they live in the heart of science. It seems like to me, right? Like, we all have this. There's a popular narrative about about the earth, about the climate, about the the pandemic spreading, like, and how you should behave as a result of it is very much an ethical monolith, right? These are the, these are the unified codes of conduct that have appeared in the last few years. And that's as close as it gets to a unified story, it seems like. And yet it's still fractured, right? Because there's a dualism there, because there is the school of thought that's like, nothing's happening, you don't have to do anything about it. And the other school of thought, which is, there's something terrible happening, we're at risk of extinction, we, we must take all possible interventions in order to prevent this. And people kind of fall somewhere along that gradient, depending on how you know authoritarian or libertarian they might be. Or risk averse or... But it, but it does seem that there's no, it seems like there's no possibility for monolith in the large grain, right? Because it, it seems almost impossible for me to believe, because this, this strikes me as the bridge between metacognition and metaethics, right? Where you look at yourself, you're like, what do I want to become? And then the next question is, okay, well, what are the rules of conduct? for how I should behave myself in order to become that. And those come with a cost, right? Like making yourself a better person. Like you want to be able to run a marathon, you're going to have to put in some painful days on your first few runs, right? And, and, and that barrier to entry seems to be at the individual level. Yeah. And the first couple of times where you spend your income on, uh, on your neighbor instead of uh, affording, you, affording yourself that expensive travel, it's... Uh, it's hurtful, but I think uh, gradually you can sort of rewire yourself into appreciating helping your neighbors more than you would uh, appreciate that uh, that expensive travel. And the so I, yeah, I I think it goes back to sort of a yeah. I think you can't escape sort of the the problem of the motivation because you you sort of well Aristotelian anthropology sort of uh, it says that you human beings always act towards some perceived good. So obviously you have to you have to perceive some good and different kind of beings, uh, different kind of human beings perceive different kind of goods. Uh, some want to be a leader in a country and use that for tyrannical reasons. Other want to uh, be as un unknown as possible and just be left alone and uh, live in harmony with nature. Uh, yeah, so it, it's sort of kind of what 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 motivates uh, that idea of goodness and where does it come from? And that's that's basically the the question of meta ethics. And can that persist in the absence of some, some more ultimate reality, such as God? So that's that's a big question. And yeah, big thinkers like Friedrich Nietzsche, obviously he said, uh, well, no. <laughs> if if God is dead, then uh, all is relative. Um, there's no there's no offer of nature. There's no up and down. There's no sort of standard beyond human beings itself, because uh, we are now sort of the. We are now the offers of reality because we are the next in uh, the, the hierarchy. We are the highest kind of beings in this uh, universe, and we are the ones who who who's the, who's deciding what's the good and evil, what's better and worse, what's uh, what's even true and untrue, what's beautiful and ugly. And, and he so sort of, he sort of hinted that that would be a complete catastrophe in the twentieth century too, if you read between the lines. It seems like. Yeah, it's 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 not something he's uh, like joyful about. If you, <laughs> that, that's probably um outdated phenomena but 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 if you sort of read the new atheists um it's kind of a 
it's kind of sort of a, an attempt to create a different sort of uh, almost religious story that they want people to identify themselves with. It's it sort of kind of it has the same it has the same contents of uh, say the Christian narrative. It sort of has uh, it it has a story about creation. Of course, we are we are developed as uh, as human beings, and we are very fortunate because we we're here because of blind natural forces making us the, the kind of way that uh, way that we are. But then then sin came into the world. Something happened because uh, things are not the, the way they're supposed to be. And all human beings uh, have a common experience that I think that uh, there's something about this world that's off. There's something about this world that's not how it's supposed to be. We we sort of have this normative idea of how things are supposed to be, and we know that the the current situation deviates from that. So. Uh, Christianity explains that about sin coming into the world, but uh, the new atheism explains that about um, uh, religion and superstition coming into the world. And but, but fortunately, we have a savior because uh, during the Enlightenment years, then for the first time ever in the history of philosophy, people started using reason and started using these uh, scientific methods, and they are going to bring us to a happy place. They're they're going to bring us to a place where we. Uh, not only make uh, incredible technological inv- advancement, but we, where we also become much more moral, both as individual and as a s- society, because there are not uh, there are not l- religious ideas uh, that sort of uh, constituting what uh, good morals are, but uh, but uh, but it's our reason. But uh, what does our reason discover? That's uh, that's an idea left up for grabs, probably. So th- there's a stark difference between a, a, a Richard Dawkins and a Friedrich Nietzsche. As you say, he's he's not kind of joyful about it, but he sort of envisaged that um, that uh, even though sort of the German intellectuals of his age in the in the late nineteenth century uh, sort of cognitively don't assent to the idea of God, they still live as he does. They still live as uh, true and true, good and evil, beauty and uh, real concepts out there in the world that sort of we sort of have to approach. But you also have this uh, myth about the, the shadow of the Buddha, uh, saying that uh, well, th- there's a famous myth about Buddha when he uh, when he were about to die, he was sort of sitting in a lotus position. Uh, so when he's dying, his his body sort of falls to the ground, but um, the shadow behind him that was uh, casting, well, the sun behind him that was sort of casting his shadow on the wall that that remains, and and as the legend have it, that uh, that shadow remains for hundreds of years. So Nietzsche says that we. We're still in the age of the shadow of the Buddha, where sort of the idea of there being an ultimate reality independently of uh, what human beings can make up for themselves uh, still um, is very much uh, influential in society. But once we, of course, once we once we get out of that shadow, then uh, uh, who's to say what's going to happen? Because uh, one person's idea of what, uh, what is good and true is uh, it not, it's not necessarily... Uh, another person, person's idea of what is good and true. So, uh, who's going to win? It's probably going to be the one with the uh, with most power, or the most charisma, or the most uh, or the best rhetorical ability to get to get lots of traction in the population, and so on. Maybe in the short term, I would buy that, but it seems like in the long term, consequence would show its face, right? It seems like to me that if you behave a certain way, certain outcomes are more likely to result than others. And so I feel like some of these old religious ideas, you know, the basic commandments, let's say in the Bible, they're not original to the Bible, for instance. Other cultures discovered those same codes of conduct independently. And they didn't do it necessarily because they were talking with the people who wrote the Bible. They they did it because those are self-evident truths and you can't have a functional society if I'm always worried about the person next to me you know, sticking me with some scissors in the side in the middle of having a conversation, right? That just wouldn't work. And, and, and each one of those laws can be deduced sort of from the natural consequences of what would result to the society if everybody disobeyed them, let's say. So it's like, yeah, but st- it just seems like they're, they're in some sense, you know, people, the, there was a huge debate over the concept of natural law, right? And, and it seems like a good case can be made that some of these behavioral principles, these ethical codes are self-evident in some sense. Yeah, but still, as, as you see, you, you're probably going to observe many kinds of consequences. But still, how, how are you supposed to measure those co- consequences if you, if you sort of don't have any, uh, any meter stick, any uh, sort of... 
frame of reference for what uh, what constitutes a uh, good um uh, good and bad uh, if you, if you if you look at other culture we we would say that uh, probably war of any kind would be horrible but in other culture you sort of have the idea that well the best thing a human being can do is to is to is to is to die in a war because then you uh, yeah so I, I think there's sort of conflicting cultural ideals that sort of the spirit of the ant <sighs> <laughs> yeah, that sort of problem, sort of uh, problematize uh, the idea that uh, well, good ethics is just a product of natural reason, mm. if if there are any. And to 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 be clear, do you think that natural ethics are possible, or do you think that it's kind of a just so story that is told? Well, because we started off by saying I don't. I think you said something in the effect of I don't know if humans can live without a unifying story. Maybe I'm going too far there. So the question is, is it possible for us to arrive at one in the age of reason? Is that, is that what you're asking? I mean, I think that the history of humans is the history of us living without a single unifying story because there's never been a global culture, right? You have people that are associated with places and their ethics and morals and systems are, are inherently related to that location and the history in that place and we live in a time where that's starting to break down because there's such movement of people from place to place and so you come you you immigrate from norway to france and all of a sudden there's like a different set of principles and both of those places are influenced by the larger principles of the EU. And the EU is influenced by the greater culture of geopolitics. But even geopolitics is kind of broken along two axes, right? We wouldn't be having this like weird Russia-China axis and like US and Europe axis if it wasn't the result of two different schools of what ethics are correct and just. And so I'm suspicious of the idea that it is possible to come up with a unifying code of ethics. And yet, I think that if you were to ask individuals in the United States and in China or in Europe and in Russia and be like, okay, is it good to lie, cheat, steal, murder? I think everybody would come up with the same collection of answers. And so there are some fundamental principles that do seem to emerge wholesale. Well, if you, if you contextualize those... Uh those commandments a bit. Uh, I, I think there are several people who would say that, well, it's correct to lie in some cases. It can be even be correct to to kill someone in some cases. So it's a sort of... Yeah, all, all, all things being equal, I, I, I think you're correct. I think it's sort of... Yeah, but when you when you sort of provide, provide some context, I, I think that uh, different cultural ideas would uh, widely differ. So what kind of context is it okay to lie in? So, um, and you talked about something else. How, how should we combat the climate crisis? Uh, I guess we're back to us, sort of the need for a, for a story, uh, the need for a, for a motivation, because there are, lots, there, are, there are lots of people that are really dedicated to, to, to solving the climate crisis and that are really altruistic even, uh, that they're sort of, they want to almost sacrifice themselves. And they also demand that others sacrifice themselves to sacrifice their comfort and and so on to sort of uh, achieve this greater good but of course that's that's uh these are very large hairy ambitions uh why should the individual care about the climate crisis uh it will probably affect the next generation more more than others so uh, yeah i i think it's sort of hard to get some collective action without some collective story about how wh why should we sacrifice why should i uh, why should I sort of lay down myself for the next generation and, and, and so on? Well, I think there's a lot of, there are very, people are become very skeptical of the hypocrisy involved in, hey, telling the poor people to give up their, you know, carbon-based fuels while the, the power elite fly around in jets to lunch in Spain on the weekend or something like that. There's, there's a disconnect where it doesn't seem totally like a genuine concern because it's, in, it's affecting the people who, who are hurting the most. Uh, and and I think that the, the the narrative just seems a little disingenuous. I think that's that's more the fray. Yeah, and also e e even though you have an end in mind, the the means to get there is not always very obvious. Here in Norway, it's a big discussion because we're we're obviously a large oil country, uh, 
and that's how we gained our wealth. Uh, and there, uh, there are big discussions that uh, well, should we should we continue doing what we do right now? Uh, should we continue uh, getting more of this uh, oil uh, up from the ocean? Should we even start new oil fields? Uh, well, it, be- it beats the hell out of what you guys were doing like a thousand and a half years ago, you know, just conquering the hell out of <laughs> out of the rest of Europe and just pillaging the rest of the of the continent. I mean, I prefer you guys yeah. keep going with the oil, personally. Yeah, the British monks are probably not happy about that. So, <laughs> I'm sorry on behalf of all of them. <laughs> yeah, so, I, I, yeah but, but even though we sort of have an end in mind that we, we have to reduce our fossil fuels, then uh, uh, Norway reducing their production of oil could also just lead to sort of the strengthening of the oil price and uh, and be beneficial for other kind of regimes in the world that's uh, that we don't want to have to amass large amounts of power uh, um, yeah and and so on so even even though sort of the goal is clear then the, the means are not that uh, clear cut uh, i would say even if the goal is to reduce the uh, usage of fossil fuels is uh, you can still have discussions whether what are the best means to that end and it just doesn't... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, sorry. I, I was kind of just concerned that we, we're pretty far off uh, the loss of nature right now. But uh, it's your podcast, so you just lead the way. Well, I think that and this... Are, and you arrest me if I uh, stray too far. I, I think that this is related to the laws of nature because, in, in, in a broader sense. Because when we come down to something like the climate crisis, we construct our story about what we should do on the basis of mathematical models. We have a law of nature that tells us about the relationship between, let's say, greenhouse gases and warming. We also have eventually developed a law of nature that codifies the contribution of human activity to that relationship. And you're absolutely right that we need to have a unifying story. And because we don't have God, we still have, like, God was the law of nature. You said that at the beginning. It's this like religious idea. Did did well, you not? Yeah, original originally the the laws of nature were framed in theological ways. Uh, I would say kind of yeah, kind of ugly ways that uh, that made God the only real causal agent in nature. Uh, a problem that we didn't have with the, the prior Aristotelianism. But uh, yeah, I, I, but I also would say that well, if if uh, if we're going to tackle the the climate crisis, then we need to bring the whole world uh, aboard and. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we're probably not going to get the narrative without God because, uh, at least in absolute numbers, the the world has never been as religious as it is right now. And uh, sort of the need to place uh, one in the one's individual narrative uh, within a greater narrative. There's, uh, I think, most people in the world will still. Uh, yeah, it's it, it's a really good way to do it if you if if you believe in a higher power to sort of locate your own story within that higher power and. Uh, and uh, hopefully the ends of that higher power. But the mathematical laws of nature are the higher power for a lot of people. The people who are sitting at the peak of these organizations, who are, you know, at the height of governments, at the height of the, the councils that put together directives, like the people at the IPCC are scientists. And I would largely you mm. might say or were at some point like many of them are now bureaucrats and like occupied I think there's about like two scientists on the I've, left. I've never actually looked and so I, I can't actually evaluate but I understand they're quantitatively oriented they're quantitatively sure. oriented and I would I would assume that most of them are not religious in the sense of like big sky god religious but I guarantee you that they view mathematical models as being something true with a capital T and if you place truth in the the bassinet of mathematics, then that is the the source of your story because you have come up with a mathematical model that is the case. And like you said earlier, you have to conceptualize the mathematical model in context of other actors because it's inert inherently, right? So you you add you define the variables inside that model as being attributed to human activity to consumption to capitalism to 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 wasteful whatever and through that attribution you create a story that is deeply deeply motivating to people because you put it in the context of good and evil of of the mythological quest to save something that is worth saving 
and it feels very theistic to me. Like, I, I cannot separate it away from a religious story. And I understand the need for it. I understand why it's there. But it feels no less religious than reading the Bible sometimes. And people, can I just add, but people have a deep, susp- I don't know about how many, but a lot of people have a deep suspicion of people pulling on their heartstrings in that way too, right? Because if you want to have a successful business or a successful state, you need people to believe in you, right? You have to have this, you have to have an almost lore about your project, right? People don't buy Nike because they're like inspecting the quality of like the, the souls or how they feel. They, they believe in Nike, right? They, they, they see the athletes that wear those shoes and they want to be like them. And it's, there's a whole mythos associated with this. This is a theoretical construction. I don't think Shiloh's ever bought Nike. I actually did own a pair of Nikes one time, just so you know. <laughs> but you you have to, so I guess there's an aspect of state crafting and of brand crafting and of, let for lack of a better word, just imperial success, whether it's in the business realm or in the political realm, that involves harnessing people's beliefs and putting them to work, essentially. And I think that that results in a lot of hesitation that might might work against any kind of unification of narratives in general. Because the Nike example is interesting because what is advertisement for Nike except you have the mandate of God if you wear Nike? Right? Like if you analyze the ads, like what is it? It's the fact that you're going to be strong, you're going to be powerful, you're going to be good looking, you're going to be able to do whatever you want to do. Like they're selling Godhood in the form of shoes and people believe in that image and so they purchase them because they're fundam- we're fundamentally supernatural creatures that need to have a story that we orient ourselves around and so the laws of nature like nike harnesses the law of nature of you know this human desire for something and sells you it in the form of a shoe and it works it works on everybody so well it's just amazing like I don't know. My my favorite climbing shoes are these uh, Anasazi uh, moccasins, and I love them because my favorite climber of all time used to wear them. And I like I know that's true. <laughs> like I this guy Dean too. Potter, just an amazing, amazing soul who unfortunately died in a tragic accident when he was wingsuiting. But when I I want those, I like wearing those shoes because it makes me think of Dean. And it's like I'm almost being part of the spirit of Dean Potter when I participate in it. And it's so like I know it's so gross and capitalistic and just materialistic and everything, but it does it does tap into that too. What if you just got shoes and wrote Dean Potter on them? <laughs> just wear a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, at least you're sort of you're sharing a common story. So I, I, yeah, it's really interesting how how these global brands sort of sell stories. They sell sort of. Uh, yeah, an idea of goodness that you can sort of connect towards to to find some purpose. I think, um, as I said, I, I studied economics before I studied philosophy, and I think, in one sense, one of the most interesting, but also one of the most scary subjects I've ever uh, I've ever um, uh, studied is uh, marketing, because marketing is basically just uh, applying uh, knowledge about human psychology to find out different kind of ways to nudge them towards, or really just manipulating them towards uh, <laughs> the goal that you want, which in uh, uh, for a business is 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 often suggested by by my products. So just to sort of just uh, try to connect them to a story that's so powerful to a human being that uh, they will actually buy your brand, which is uh, five times the cost of uh, something else that has just the same quality, but. Uh, you choose to buy my brand because you want to connect to my story because I've, I've, I've shown you some athletes that you have, have, have as role models and uh, they wear my brand. So by wearing that brand, you're a part of that story. Yeah, I think I read that Silicon Valley was the biggest employer of psychology graduate students or something like that. I could never Couldn't dig through. I could not track down the source of that, but I also read that somewhere. Yeah, it makes sense though. Yeah. And it's it is kind of just trying to locate what is the what is the weaknesses of human psychology and how do we find the most efficient way to target those. And it's like I think that being able to see these patterns and seeing the way that they play out in the world around you is important for finding meaning and being able to find this thing that you're working towards in the absence of all of the things that buffet you from the sides because you're constantly inundated by stories we're surrounded by competing stories everybody wants to pull you into 
their world and get your allegiance for whatever metaphysical principles they're putting down. And yeah. go ahead. No, I, I seen uh, I seen some uh, researchers trying to sort of connect uh, uh, a growing secularity with the sort of the, the successfulness of these uh, global brands. Because yeah, like like you said, sort of the the breakdown of this uh, this universal stories that were sort of that used to motivate us, that they used to. Uh, well, me me and my local community, we would gather in church every Sunday, and we sort of sharing one story. We're sort of when you have this breakdown of these stories, and we, uh, I don't have a place to meet my uh, uh, to meet the people in my community anymore. But I can sort of try to find some some other story that would provide that uh, that whole. Uh, uh, with that purpose that was supposed to give, so I can now I can I can be a part of the Nike story. I can or I can be a Swifty and I can be a part of that story, or uh, and so on and so on. It's fascinating. So it's probably the the emergence of these global brands would not have been that effective if it was not accompanied by the secularization, at least of our our, our little corner of the secular uh, uh, of the secular West. That's an interesting idea. Like, I wonder if it wouldn't have just been transmuted into, like, selling to religious sects. You know, like, all good Christians wear Nike or something like that. And it would be, like, <laughs> Jesus in the advertisements. I mean, one, is, one he's aspect... He's on the cross of, and he's wearing Nike. I'm sorry. <laughs> one aspect of this that's really fascinating is how it kind of comes full circle on itself. So you have this, like, new rationalist movement and people who are absolutely dedicated to finding the unified theory of everything and and the quantitative law that describes the universe, you know? And it's interesting because if that is even possible, if you can make a formula that describes how everything operates all at once somehow, which that's a totally different uh, argument whether you buy that or not, but certainly people do. And what's interesting is that it does tend towards something approximating a simulation theory. Like it does essentially point to if all of the, like if everything is laid out by these laws perfectly, they're all predetermined. There's no room for mind and will at that point, and you essentially have us being little apparitions inside of some computer program. And then the funny thing is, well, what is that? What is this cosmic computer program? If not just God in the first place, it's like you've reinvent, you've found yourself all the way back to the beginning of the game. Yeah, well, well, I agree, and I, I don't remember who, but I think it was someone who commented it when, uh, when Max Tegmark and Elon Musk are talking about this big simulation theories and saying that well, it's kind of just uh, finding a way back to back to theism. But I should add a, a really ugly form of theism because it's kind of a a god version that's sort of just a puppet show where we're all just uh, playing a part for the entertainment of uh, <laughs> of of some creator, even if it's some simulator or some aliens or um, yeah or whatever. So what do you hey, think? You, Oh, go, no, go ahead. Yeah, no, no. You talk about reductionism, and that's uh, that's very interesting, and it's uh, I think it's really linked to the idea of the the laws of nature. I believe my uh, when I was a teenager, I was uh, really into uh, yeah, like a what what I like to call a scientific approach to the world, which I later found out was really a scientistic uh, approach to the world. My dream, my, my dream was sort of, of course, this this world is really messy. Um, so how can you sort of reduce it down to uh, down to levels that uh, that are more easy to compre comprehend? And uh, at the primary school, I was uh, really good at math. So in my local communities, I was just uh, sort of known as the as as the math kid, uh, which is a very popular thing to be called if you want to be cool at school. By the way, uh, so I sort of just dreamed of everything being reducible to maths. Uh, and yeah, obviously that's that's the dream of the reductionist that. Uh, that uh, psychology can just be uh, sort of reduced to being applied biology, and biology can just be reduced to being applied chemistry, and chemistry can just be reduced to being uh, applied physics. And I, I remember thinking that um, well, I was learning about ethics, and ethics is so messy because uh, there's all these principles, and you have to try to find good ways how to uh, how to treat yourself, how to treat your fellow human beings. So, so, so my dream as a youth was uh, well. When I grew up, I would I would find mathematical ways of doing ethics because I, I was certain that all of these variables that are are in ethics could probably be quantified at some level, and then, yeah, doing ethics would just be um, doing a mathematical equation, which is kind of uh, a bit uh, what the utilitarians are trying to do, but I think it's uh, very unsuccessful. 
So did, did you become disillusioned? What, oh, sorry. Oh, this is basically, I mean, isn't this what game theory is attempting to accomplish, essentially? Uh, it, yeah, perhaps with some with some subtleties, but I think, yeah, yeah, like, like the wet dream of a utilitarian, utilitarian is sort of trying to have this common currency. Like, uh, if, if all the world currencies are... Uh, uh, converted into one common currency, that would obviously be easier if you don't have uh, Japanese and Norwegian and uh, US and uh, Brazilian and all these kind of currencies. It would, be, it would much, be much easier just to have one common currency. And for the utilitarian, they, they want to also have one common cur uh, currency, which you can measure as uh, utility or uh, uh, pleasure versus pain and so on. And if it's possible to sort of convert all possible goods uh, into this common currency, uh, yeah, so, so so helping my neighbor would be, say, 40. Uh, having a good dinner would be 10. So everything sort of relates to this uh, common currency. And then you can just put it into mathematical frameworks. And the only purpose of ethics is just to maximize the things on the plus side and minimize the things on the, on, on the negative side. And that would be, yeah, the dream of being a mathematician and uh, doing ethics. And it, it sounds very scientific and very uh, rational, but... Um, the older you get, the uh, <laughs> the more you see that this is a very simplistic uh, view of the world. Well, it's interesting because I think that Max Tegmark never reached the age where he came to believe that that was a really simplistic view of the world. And so what happened to you that you realized that it was? Well, I think, first of all, you s there's... There's sort of kind of a, hi a hierarchy of goods, and I think the only purpose of human life is not just to maximize the goods and minimize the, the negatives, but also uh, this common currency just seems kind of random. Why should utility, whatever that is, it's uh, you can ask utilitarians, and there are probably as many definitions that there as there are uh, utilitarians or or pleasure or something else. And uh, least of all, how do you convert things that are widely different? Uh, how can you convert? Uh, Jumping into into the river to save a drowning child, how can you convert that into a currency uh, and sort of measure it against uh, having a good meal or experience a Bach symphony or um, and all all these kind of goods in the world? So, I I just think that there are there are so many layers to the natural world that uh, it, I I I I very much understand the dream of <laughs> of sort of reducing everything to a mathematical level, but um, yeah, I I think it's a bit infantile and I think it's. Uh, uh, it should stay at the dream level. Good, that good. So that might be a good place to move into what what do you think should be in its place as an approach to understanding the natural world, okay. or maybe we've already like hit on that hit that on the head with this idea of meta narratives and so forth. But what do you think would be either a better direction for science, or does science? hold no chance of being able to address everything in the universe and we should just leave science to what it's good at and then approach metaphysical questions with some other process hey folks quick interruption we wanted to tell you about our first demystify live event which is happening in austin texas this april 7th and 8th we're going to get together check out the solar eclipse listen to some talks from a few of our favorite guests across the past couple years and we're going to hang out together we're going to actually try to establish some real life friendships that are not just part of this internet your faceless universe so come hang out and i'll see you there yeah well perhaps i can cheer a bit by just uh, asking you because you say that well you very gracefully said that my essay sort of touched the nerve um uh, trying to sort of elaborate on some questions that you just found an answer that uh, this kind of uh, scientists and physicists and uh, people that you were talking to just thought that well what lies sort of behind behind this reality that is the loss of nature didn't even find out a meaningful question. So, yeah, sort of what uh, what kind of unrest uh, is created in you that uh, you felt that that the essay touched a nerve? Well, so I, I'm not at the end of this journey in trying to understand the universe, and I, I probably <laughs> right. I soon, mean, soon though. Yeah, yeah so, uh, I mean, in the next couple of days at least. Um, yeah, but, but, but you know, it sounds ridiculous, but this is something that I think is really important when you're when you're approaching uh, when you're approaching the pursuit of understanding nature. You're probably not going to get to the end of it, and you have to be okay with that. One thing that's 
really helped me sort things out is to take the preeminency of physics out of the picture a little bit, right? So there's this strange hierarchy that's appeared inside of the academy, so in the university structure, where, like, you already broke it down, where it's basically the biologists reach the bottom of some system, they say the chemists take over from here, the chemists reach the bottom of some system, the physicists take over from here, and the buck stops at the physicists, right? And so everybody kind of looks at the physicists with, like, physics envy. Like, they're like, well, I kind of wish I was a physicist because they, the, <laughs> they seem to be the ones in charge of the show. Yeah. And so for me, it's been really productive to realize that physics is in its best, most honest form is really only capable about describing how material bodies interact with one another to produce phenomena. And I don't think that material bodies interacting to produce phenomena is necessarily the best lens to approach a lot of the questions that we have about this universe. And so I think there's other ways of approaching that. And one of my favorites is art, music, poetry, narrative, um, conversation, right? There's, there's a number of ways to understand this bizarre place that we all woke up into one day that don't necessarily involve breaking it down into its material actions. And so I've been accused of being a dualist for this reason, I suppose. Uh, but it it helps me to keep those things separate. Like I keep my physics really boring and really based in just materials either pushing or pulling on each other. And they could be hypothetical, whatever. I'm fine with entertaining it. But I, I sort of leave everything at the door there. And then when I'm not doing physics, I can entertain all sorts of abstract concepts and so forth because I'm not limited to that really boring world of material science, essentially. Um, whereas I see a lot of modern physics getting tangled up. It doesn't want to just stay in the realm of material interactions. It wants to get into God particles and, you know, impossible time warps and just this whole realm of mythology. And even the fact that physics has taken over the, the, the field of cosmology is really, really funny to me. Because cosmology, of course, was always this very metaphysical pursuit of what are human beings in the context of the universe and so forth. And uh, I, I just think that it's a little bit, uh, it, it's a little bit of a shame that physics has become king of the castle because I don't think that the universe is exclusively a physical operation. I don't think that that's the best way to understand it always. So that's kind of what motivated me to come into this discussion. Do you, do you have anything to add, Nastya? Hey, hey. Well, well, you you talked about that. You think that uh, lots of people sort of have this uh, U.S. maths as God almost. At least that's as the very rock bottom of reality. So it, it seems that uh, you you don't uh, share that view. So <laughs> what kind of frustrates you with uh, with that? Well, I think the maths. Step, I think that it, when it comes to physics, I think the the maths are simply parameterizing what. The, uh, in the best case scenario, the laws are telling us what the bodies are doing. They're sort of a map of the interactum, right? But the problem for me comes when there are no material bodies at the bottom of the math, right? When I get into talking with a quantum physicist and it's like, like Nastia said earlier, these vector fields are doing something. I'm like, that makes no sense because a vector field is a dynamic representation of something doing something. And we're not talking about material bodies anymore. So what are we talking about? And it's like the the sort of irrational, unterminating end of that story is what frustrates me uh, in that realm. That's why I feel like ending at an abstraction in a... Look, ending at an abstraction in a metaphysical presentation, I'm cool with that. Because I realize that we're trying to approximate these multivariate complex systems and simplify them so we can come to conclusions. But... Ending a physics presentation in an abstraction seems like heresy to me because <laughs> because it has to physics is dull dead I don't know that's I'm not uh, maybe I'm getting too emotional with that not necessarily dead but it's it's just about materials interacting there's nothing um, there's nothing abstract about that you know a material is pretty obvious like children know the difference between a material and a concept right I mean concepts are of course relational and so forth and 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 materials. Uh, well, they have surfaces, right? They have locations in the physical universe with respect to all the other materials, right? It's, it's not hard to know what a material is versus an abstraction. And yet, 
physics seems to terminate in abstractions. And it's just sort of maddening to me when I get to the bottom of these, because I really am curious about what's happening down there at the smallest levels. Like, what is the cause of these uh, invisible phenomena? I'm endlessly trying to, to hypothesize about the causes of these things. But the causes certainly for me, when I explain them to myself, I will never feel satisfied if it terminates in an abstraction, because it's physics. It needs to terminate in material bodies. Yeah, but you say that you're you're curious about what happened at the smallest level, but aren't we uh, aren't we curious at what what's happening at large level? Oh, so, that too, of course, I, I, of course. I'm very curious about what the, what enables sort of the capacities of a human being. But, and that's why I think it's important at what happens at the smallest level, because. Shiloh uses metaphysics in a really different way from the way that I use metaphysics. So for me, metaphysics is like the set of rules at the foundation of your belief system. And Shiloh uses it more in the sense where it's the things that are corporeal are physics and the things that are spiritual are metaphysics. I think that's how you use it in your presentation. And Dynamics, so, patterns, behaviors. And so I'm like, okay, so if you, if I, if I make the metaphysical presentation where I'm like, okay, you have two possibilities for foundational reality. Foundational reality is physical. Foundational reality is mathematical. If you live in a physical world, then I think that there are much higher stakes at play for you as an individual, and you are obligated to make different decisions about the world than if you live in a place where everything is foundationally mathematical, because then you're in a simulation and it's a game and you can just fuck around. And so I, th I, I really, I really think that like, that's why it drives me crazy. I'm like less fascinated by the specifics of, you know, how light and electricity work, that those are also interesting to me. I think that it is, I've been saying this a lot during this conversation. I think that science is a story that we tell ourselves about how the world works. And if we end on mathematics, then what we're telling ourselves is that we live inside of a computer program and what comes out of that is a belief system that I don't think is very good for the people who really deeply subscribe to it because it is kind of, I, I think that the, the end point of that mindset is that you have woken up inside the simulation, therefore you can control the simulation, therefore you are God, and it places humans outside of this network of consequences that the world will have to bear on them. And so when we talk about Nietzsche, and Nietzsche's saying that, you know, God is dead and that's going to be a really bad thing, it's like he almost sees what happens when humans no longer find themselves to be to owe anything to their environment and to their surroundings and to the rest of this ecological web. Like, I don't think that Nietzsche was thinking about ecology, but I think that he was putting into play this idea that when we no longer feel like we are subservient to something, chaos comes out of that. Because then all we can do is look inside of ourselves. And it's like, if you've ever ruminated on a thought when you're feeling depressed or anxious or whatever, you know that rumination on your interior world is the worst thing that you can do. The only thing that brings you peace in that moment is to go out and to see yourself in connection to other things and then to start to think of like how to improve those connections and gradually pull yourself out of the hole that you're in. And so for me, I think that that's why the fundamental laws of nature have to be figured out in a way that is more material than mathematical because what are we doing if we live in a simulation? Yeah. Well, I believe there's a third option as well, which is, of course, that ultimate reality is, uh, is, is divine. But I'm very curious because you say that, well, if all the world is natural, then the stakes are higher because we sort of have a responsibility. Uh, but does that follow automatically? Because if, even though I'm a single entity among other single entities, then why should I have any responsibility even though we're, we're sort of all a part of the same stuff, so to speak. I mean, there's a functionalist uh, argument that that it will work out better for you. Uh, <laughs> like, th like seriously, like one of the best cures for depression is taking care of something else that's alive. Uh, they tell people to get pets or to cultivate a garden. Uh, you know, it actually does make you feel better to be 
a more egalitarian actor in the world. Yeah, but but it's also research that's saying that uh, well, religious people attending church once a week also make you a happier human being and connects you with the local community. So that's true. if we're just following the functional argument, I think there there's lots of things that follow. That's true. I think that's that true. I think that nature is divine, and therefore, what do you can we define that word? Well, actually, you you used it. What do you mean, divine? <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. Like, I probably agree with you. I'm just, I'm curious. Like, what, you, what that? That's what. See, I think it matters to define these words, though, because otherwise, it has too much valence, and people just can insert whatever the hell they want into that phrase, and they might mean that guy in the sky pulling the strings. I don't know. I mean, it's it, so. So yeah. What What do you mean by that? Well, uh, now I can probably reveal that uh, I I am a Christian theist, so. I actually believe that uh, classical theism is a is a good way to to understand the world. As sort of the natural world sort of flows from the from the divine logos that uh, that sort of embodies the best of what the uh, Greek philosophers to, to talked about. Uh, and saying that is obviously not that. That's why I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of I I am as a Christian I'm very cr- critical of other Christians. Uh, Giving uh, uh, giving bad portrayals of uh, uh, of God because I think it in- invites uh, misunderstandings and uh, I think that's uh, that's awful. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't know if you want me to proceed to sort of try to define what the, what what God is, but um, yeah, it's 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 kind of an at least it's it's it, it's something that's not identical to the material world, but it's sort of intim- intimately related in 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 some way. And that's how classical theism, that's kind of com- common to both the Greeks, to, uh, uh, to, to Jewish theology, to uh, Muslim theology, to Christian theology, and um, even some sorts of uh, Hinduist uh, uh, theology. Is it, an I- of, is it an idealism? Is it something to aim for? Uh, what do you mean? Th- this, this concept of God or this concept of uh, divine... Uh, mandate or, or whatever i forget what we're we're to- we're very comfortable discussing the idea of like how one defines god we've had religious conversations on the podcast like this is not this is not a uh, uncharted ground for us so if you want to that would be interesting yeah and like full <laughs> disclosure i think there's a i mean i think that the christian uh mythos has a, a great deal. there's a, there's incredible stories with great value for for people's lives for sure i mean i think there's there's a lot to to draw on there for sure well, I, 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 I sort of think that uh, it does matter actually how we sort of view the ultimate reality because I think that other ideas flows from from that very thing, and not only sort of whether it's it's God or matter or mathematics or what it is, but sort of what um, what kind of stories do do we tell each other? What kind of uh, what kind of ideas are implanted in our culture by uh, by this uh, um, by this unmoved mover by this uh, by this first cause? So obviously, what classical theism means means with God is not uh, this an- anthropomorphized thing that you often hear in popular culture that you see in art. That's it's it's actually a man. It's it doesn't make sense even to talk about uh, the the sex of God because he has nothing of he has nothing of the kind that we that we uh, that we usually identify sex with. He doesn't have sexual organs or uh, um, or anything. But it's uh, yeah, it's it's kind of uh and and an intellect lying there at the very bottom so um for example i i think a good way to start is uh, actually the, the the gospel of john is sort of the most philosophical i can i can think of because in the beginning sort of john thinks that well i he lives a couple of hundred years after the after the great philosophers after plato and aristotle so this this kind of ideas are sort of a part of his culture and he starts uh, the gospel of john the of John by saying that, well, in the beginning was the Logos. Uh, and then he proceeds to sort of identify God with the Logos. So sort of the very thing that uh, the Greek philosophers used to sort of speak about what makes the world intelligible, what's kind of the uh, the cause of order behind all of this. Uh, John sort of proceeds to identify with God. And uh, yeah, but you... you you sort of you sort of speak about classical theism as kind of a you can you can reason yourself to 
making this kind of skeleton, this uh, skeleton guy, this bear stripped guy with certain properties that uh, that can sort of then be supplied with the different kind of clothing that the uh, different uh, kind of re- revealed religions uh, lay on top of it. And that's that's a thing to discuss. But yeah, you, you can, of course, a guide is something vastly other. I think uh, we we as human beings, we only we are only able to understand things that we experience in this world, as Aristotle says, that our, our knowledge sort of are provided through the senses. And obviously, we, we have no sensical information about uh, such a different kind of thing that um, God is supposed to be. Well, so like, I, I, can... I guess the reason I asked whether it's an idealism is there's this, there's this idea in a number of religions, which is that humans are, in some sense, made in the image of God. Like, we are attempting to embody that in our best form something like that. Mm. And so that makes me think that this concept of divine is sort of like a target for us to aim at, something like that. Yeah. And um, and people need targets. Yeah. People need targets really bad. <laughs> I guess that's what, like our conversation today has been swirling around really, uh, you know, chaotically is that people want they want rules, like they want to know that if this happens, then that will happen. If I do this, then that will happen. Like, and and, and I think this concerns this desire to fixate on on an aim and be oriented towards something, right? It's like, you know, I like you think about these addiction programs, like Alcoholics Anonymous, right? You, they, they, the key component of it is that you surrender yourself to some higher power, right? And you might think, well, that's really weird, like for a secular, uh, you know, addiction treatment program. But it's like, it makes sense because if you're no longer serving this substance, you need to serve something, right? I think it was the Dylan song, you got to serve somebody, right? So what are you going to serve? And it's like, how about the archetypical representation of the best version of yourself? What, What would that look like? Would that look like praying to God, something like that? Well, well, there's a famous author called uh, David Foster Wallace, and he has he, he was an ag- agnostic himself, but he has this really interesting quote uh, saying that, well, everyone worships. So yeah, you, you don't really get to get an option whether to worship or not, because that's, uh, that's inherent to human beings. So the only things you get to choose, actually, is, is, is what you worship. And he says that, uh, well, if, if, if you're going to worship something uh, within this world, uh, it's probably going to break you, because if you if you worship uh, riches, that's that's going to break you, because uh, nothing is ever going to be enough. If you worship beauty, then that's going to break you, because so- someday you're going to be uh, uh, be old and probably not uh, fit the ideals you had as a youth. So you you sort of you you're going to die a thousand deaths before you finally and die die the final time. So he sort of said that. Well, the good thing about placing sort of the the source of the aim beyond this natural world is that you always have something strive. You always have something to strive for. That's um, uh, yeah. That will sort of take you take you throughout life. Um, Do you think it's possible to yeah. worship life itself and get around that? <laughs> yeah. Well, what what do you mean by life? Like the concept of life. That there are like, some living things in... Like to no, make like, it Aristotelian again, essentially? Or? No, just to see the whole arc of birth and growth and Generation. maturation and death and this entire process that every living being on Earth goes through and the the act of predation and the act of consumption and your role inside of a network of other beings and how you relate to them and also how you relate to the planet because the planet is tied into all of these cycles, right? At the smallest level, bacteria are literally taking rocks and transforming them into organic matter, which then eventually gets deposited again into rocks and then, you know, a million years from then, bacteria are back eating them again. And so it just seems like that massive project that we're all a part of that has kind of a symphonic aspect to it is maybe the most divine thing that i can think of where it's like it's it's within the natural world 
but it is the whole of the natural world. It is the interconnection. It is the dependencies and the obligations. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think it all comes down to sort of what what's behind this thing that we call the good that we're striving for. So if if Aristotle is correct that uh, well, all all conscious human behavior can sort of be accounted for in human beings striving towards some perceived good, uh, even though it's uh, uh, immediate pleasure or some long term goal of being healthy uh, or anything. I, I think it's yeah, it all comes down to sort of what is behind that notion we have of the good and how do we justify that. And then this is this is court all human beings. All all human beings sort of need a need a reason to get up in the morning. Um, if you're if you're a nursing student getting up in the morning and saying that, well, now I'm going to I'm going to the university I'm, and I'm studying nursing, it's because you've identified some good about uh, getting some knowledge and you know, y- utilizing that knowledge to uh, help other human beings in, uh, who are suffering, who uh, yeah, to, to help fulfill their potential. Or if you're a if you're a physicist. Uh, a student of physics uh, getting up in the morning it's because you think that well uh, i i want to know i i want to sort of push the boundaries of science uh, a bit further and of course the question is why because because i think there's something good about uh, contribute contributing to the accumulation of human knowledge or if you're a music student getting up in the morning it's probably because you're thinking well you know the the problem with this world is that it's not that there's too much beauty. So I, I want to study and I want to, I want to learn uh, about music for you and I want to l- learn about what creates harmony so I can sort of contribute to the beauty of this world. So I think it all sort of all com- comes down to what, what is behind these uh, different kind of concepts. Why, why is truth important? Why is uh, beauty important? Why is uh, goodness towards other human beings important? And um, yeah, the... Uh, the Obviously, the the first answer is because, well, uh, behind these notions of truth, goodness, and beauty, there's uh, there's sort of the ultimate cause and uh, also our ultimate goal of of the universe. But they can, uh, I guess, they can also sort of be uh, alternatives. You don't sort of have to consciously think that, well, <laughs> when I want to help other people, it's because I want to sort of share in the goodness that is uh, that is flowing from God uh, itself. But uh, yeah, it's it's because you sort of identified something inherent to that thing that's uh, really worth striving for, and uh, yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I think that's here you sort of have worldviews con- conflicting. Uh, uh, yeah, and and of course, if 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 Nietzsche is correct, then all of this sort of all of this sort of breaks down because uh, why should I sort of perceive truth as an in- inherent good that I should uh, sacrifice my life and. Uh, uh, sit in books and uh, say to my friends that sorry I can't uh, I can't come with you to the Coldplay concert tonight because I have to study and I have to push uh, the boundaries of science a bit forward. Uh, <laughs> yeah, why why is that important? Even if uh, even if uh, truth and beauty and goodness are just uh, illusionary fictions that we tell ourselves, and the only thing the only thing existing is uh, man's imagination, how we yeah the the, the will to power ultimately. So, 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 so you say that well, well, can life be in be that itself? Then I'm sort of curious that well, what is sort of the value about the eternal repetition of living things? That what is the inherent value of that that can sort of make that a good candidate to being almost an ultimate goal for human goodness? I, th- I mean, it would be hard to enumerate them without having them be covered by the basis of beauty and i think it's bigger than that i think that uh life is the the same way that you go down into biology and you find that it is the border and the bridge between the quantum and the material i think that life is the bridge between the cold death of all matter and its constant renewal and so i think that if you put life not just humans but life in general as this engine that moves things through the universe and organizes them like we're very complex crystalline systems that are breaking apart other materials in order to produce external entropy but we are very organized and so we're these machines of renewal that I think that the universe needs in order to not die. 
Well, what, what is this universe that needs life? Well, I think that if you just have rocks, everything gets cold eventually. Like, I think everything yeah, but, just, the temperature but, but, but just equalizes. You, you almost talk like um, a universe is sort of, a, of an agent with, uh, with needs, but uh, I guess that's... Well, it doesn't. It doesn't have to have needs. It just happens to have life within it. And now that we're here, we're part of a project that is to keep it going, because it's more beautiful that way. Because then it can gaze upon itself. It can gaze upon well, itself. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely agree. But I, I, I still uh, suspect that that might be from a human viewpoint. So, isn't isn't sort of the universe? Isn't that sort of just a name we give to the accumulation of all natural things that exist within this uh, space time continuum? Or it, possibly multiple space-time continuums. But I think that all don't don't you think that all animals have a sense of that? Like their universe might not be, you know, as far as the edge of the, the universe, thirteen point eight billion light years away, or something. But don't you think that every single little creature has a universe that is one in which it lives and wants to maintain and wants to participate in? And it must do its thing beautifully. Like we're in the woods and there's the termites. And Shiloh made this really fascinating discovery where there's this field and there's all these little hillocks in the field. They're just mounds covered over with grass. And he's like, I think that those are old termite mounds. Like they're the, old tree stumps. They're old tree stumps that the, the termites digested. And now they've returned to the earth and the termites have moved to the next tree stump and they're hard at work digesting it. And they've made the most lovely grassy little knolls out of it. Right? And so what they leave in their wake is this, is, is fertile ground for something else to grow. And I... I know that this is kind of like an absurd thing in in the sciences, right? If you have an atheistic science to say that the termite takes joy in doing the work of the termite is kind of a forbidden thing to say, but I think that they do. And I think that they have some rudimentary sense of their role. They're and like their... serving the logos, though, I guess, in his model. That's what they're doing. Sure. And so I just like, I think that all the way down, it's there. Yeah. Well, it's it's probably, yeah. Fulfilling its purpose is sort of uh, acting towards what it was uh, tending towards, given its uh, given its nature, and um, perhaps that's just what the joy is. At least it is for Aristotle. A joyful life or our happy life is uh, living our lives towards uh, our own end. It's it's not just uh, that one uh, feeling of euphoria that we get when we uh, discover something beautiful, or that we hear for the first time that. Uh, the woman we love also love us back, but uh, it's not only restrained to those kind of emotions. But uh, yeah, it's well. Aristotle says that you you cannot know whether a man is happy until he's dead, because then his life is fulfilled. So you can sort of say that well, did did he live towards his purpose or didn't he? And I think that that's the crisis of meaning that is wiping everybody out. Like, you can't feel like you're living towards your meaning if you're going to some email job that you hate. And you're pouring 40, 50, 60 hours a week into something that just feels like it's not purposeful. Yeah. And and, sort of, we have some general purpose as a human being, but also we have some, some individual purpose, given that we have some special skill set. And of course, if you, if you have a skill set that we find philosophy or teaching philosophy incredibly uh, fulfilling, and that's... That's a real talent I have, and that's uh, that's probably why why I'm put here on this earth. And then I'm stuck in another dead end job. Then I'm probably not going to feel happy as well because I I'm not experiencing that I'm living towards the, my inherent purpose. Uh, in the same manner, if you if you put the plant in the uh, in the basement or if you put the squirrel in a cage, it's probably going to be frustrated because it cannot do <laughs> it sort of can it cannot live towards its telos. Uh, you cannot climb trees and uh, yeah be a free and happy squirrel. So would you define logo, the logos as the pursuit, the un, uh, unbridled pursuit of the telios? Um. <laughs> uh, I, that sounds like a too narrow definition. Okay. Um. <laughs> because that's just what it sounds like to me. It just sounds like this idea that there's like a a, a purpose that you're serving at any given time that's that's in some sense constrained by your nature or by the nature of the universe as it might be and that 
that purpose is in some sense uh, aimed at some end, maybe, and they can be related in this way. Yeah, well, if we identify the Logos with uh, with God, as uh, John does in his Gospel, then uh, obviously the Logos is sort of what's, what's underlying all the material re reality, sort of providing it with this intelligibility and its uh, potential for existence in every instant. So, yeah, I, I guess that's part of it, but I, I sort of wouldn't, I wouldn't restrain the definition of the Logos to, to that. Well, it's just interesting because Anastasia seemed to be making this model where she was imagining that life was guided by this end, this teleos, which is to survive and, and flourish. And that the logos would be that which serves the teleos of the survival and thrival of life in but general. Like the set, of, the set of principles that you follow in fulfilling that? I guess so. That's what it sounded like to me a little bit. I don't know. I mean, I guess a natural question here too is just, um, and maybe we can close down on this, is why do you think people are so resistant to this idea? Like the way that you talk about this to which, concept. Sorry, to which idea? Sorry? You said to this idea, but I don't know which This one. idea of God. This idea of uh, divine logos. Why in the world are people resistant to it? And why do they prefer, uh, well, mathematics? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I guess it's a story about narrative, once again. That, uh, well, the term God has lots of cultural ba baggage, and uh, different kind of people and different kind of culture will have different kind of baggage. Uh, so, I, uh, yeah, and as you say, that uh, I know that in the US there's talk about sort of the rise of the nuns, um, but the nuns are not, uh, the, the nuns are not, um, the, the nuns doesn't have to be atheists. They sort of just have some notion of a divine. But they want to sort of be outside of. Uh, uh, they don't want a label, or they don't want to be uh, something that can be affiliated with or organized uh, religion. So I think a, a, a lot of scientists, at least, wouldn't sort of. Uh, even though, as you say, that uh, Max Tegmark and people like that is very, very <laughs> close. But um, of course, if you, if you're a scientist and if you're, if you're grown up with the narrative that uh, well, religion and uh, this idea of God is sort of the the biggest barrier to science because you have this. Uh, reiteration of what historians call the conflict myth that once upon a time there was uh, Greeks and there was Romans and there was uh, well, almost a scientific breakthrough but then then came Christianity and then came or organized religion and there was just this uh, big black hole <laughs> but suddenly in the Renaissance and the Enlightenment we sort of we gained back the resources from uh, from uh, yeah the intellectual resources from the Romans and the Greeks, uh, not because of uh, Christianity and the institutional support of the church, but the, despite of it. So, of course, you want to be very hesitant because uh, not only do you, you don't want to identify yourself with uh, with that kind of history, you don't want you don't want to be a part of that. You want to be the the light knight in shining armor that sort of slays the dragon that is religion and is now pointing your way towards a brighter future to, uh, with uh, with reason and science and. Uh, yeah, uh, and and also if you if you talk about sign if you talk about God publicly, that will have lots of connotations to different kind of people, and I, I think it's much it's it's much safer to to to, to use other terms, uh, so so you sort of won't be misunderstood by other other scientists uh, other scientists that uh, carries their own cult cultural baggage. I think that's definitely true. Yeah, and I think that's a reasonable fear. I mean, I, I there are tons of horror stories from the Middle Ages. You know, I, I was just talking about Giordano Bruno with my my class this morning. Actually, you know, they burned the the church burned this guy at the stake in front of three hundred thousand onlookers. You know, it was it was a real nightmare. So there, there's a few of these right that people can can point to about the horrors, right? And, and, and of course, like I think there's a more reasonable way of looking at that, which is looking at the church as more of a state actor in that situation as well. And, and uh, just the same way that, that the climate narrative is or the COVID narrative is enforced, I think that the theologic narrative was enforced uh, at the point of a gun in those days as well. But does that really have anything to do with the Logos or with John's sermons? Probably not at all. And so people get distracted by, I think, the institutional layer of the church and Maybe that's what makes it such so unpalatable to many rationalists today. 
Yeah, and I, and I also think that uh, there's there's a reason why the anecdotes of Bruno and uh, Galileo Galilei uh, usually is retold and retold and retold because they're anecdotes to sort of provide a a story that became popularized uh, first and foremost in the 19th century as sort of a political means to uh, uh, as a club that you could uh, club the church with because they they wanted the church to have less power and this new up and coming science was a, was a great way to do that just by sort of framing it as a in opposition to science um probably a dichotomy that would be very unknown to all of the uh, medieval actors that were actually part of uh, uh, that were the pioneers of this new uh, collection of scientific uh, methods so uh, of course I, I agree with you that uh, I don't want to defend everything that the church has done um I think there's a fair, fairly good case to be made that Bruni is not a martyr of science, even though that Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson tried to portray him as that. But it's, yeah, it's it's awful that he's burned at the stake, but it's because of heretical theological ideas. So, a hundred percent, yeah, I, I, yeah. I often ask uh, people that are sort of just so insistent that well, the church and science are uh, they are at odds, they are arch enemies, and everything. That's yeah, just try to provide me with with, with one example that the church has actually persecuted people for doing science uh, well they banned uh, a bunch of Descartes they, books yeah they, they have been uh, <laughs> yes <laughs> I mean like I think that you can look through the history and you can find plenty of examples of like you, Bruno perhaps is and Galileo are really uh, emotional and poignant examples but I'm not sure that the church was a place of free inquiry or openness to new ideas or challenges to theology like i think that that's not i don't think that's fair well if you if you walk down that track i i, I say that at least that that story is very much uh, nuanced by because at the other at the other end you have sort of this church pro providing institutional support by uh, having universities growing up in the shadow of cathedrals by uh, being uh, yeah mo mo most of the scientists were clergy because that's where the gutter education and and so on. So, I, yeah, I don't want to uh, uh, get under the rug that the awful thing has happened. Um, I just think that most historians uh, kind of just uh, al almost no historians of science take, take this conflict thesis uh, seriously because the, they say that when you when you actually study history, the <laughs> the relations are more intertwined and uh, uh, complicated than that. I, I mean, that's definitely true. There's there's a ton of universities, like you said, that were associated with churches, and the church gave priests sinecures so they could spend their lives Scribes studying things. And, and, you know, even Gregor Mendel. I think Darwin graduated from a, a theological <laughs> seminary of some sort. Yeah, and some of his uh, closest compatriots, like Asia Gray, was uh, uh, also Christians. But uh, there's also another level, actually, that, uh, well, the, the modern scientific methods sort of needed this... Uh, uh, it requires some very specific philosophical ideas to even flourish. Uh, ideas that are not obvious, even though we think they are. For example, you, you're you probably better off having a linear view of time than having a cyclical view of time. And obviously, uh, 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 Jewish and Christian thinkers sort of grew up in an environment where these cyclical ideas were very prevalent. But of course, if if history is just repeating itself endlessly, then sort of the notion of accumulation of knowledge is uh, is less motivating than if the history, as the Torah uh, says, has a beginning and an end, and there's actually some real notion of progress possible uh, on that pathway. And obviously you have, this, uh, you have this prerequisite that, well, the natural world needs to be ordered, that ancient cultures didn't believe in, or they believed in lots of gods that sort of have each of their... Uh, as E.O. Wilson says, that he thinks that actually the original modern science is is that people didn't believe in many gods, sort of in each inhabiting their own domain of nature, but they're just being a single monotheistic god. Uh, and it's sort of placed outside of nature itself, as the Torah uh, um, explains that uh, God created, but he created the nature as something else than uh, itself. So studying nature is not off, off limits to us because we, we don't encounter actual gods or spirits within the woods or the mountains or the sun or something but yeah it's 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 something that's uh, put uh, put before us as a as a thing to investigate and also that we are created in the image of god and if god if it's true that god is sort of some of the things that we can say about god is that god is pure intellect and uh, also has something 
analogous to will, then I think you can say something profound about human beings that uh, perhaps we also have something, some of the same capacities that enables us, unlike dogs, even though they're very cute, to actually go out, venture into nature and try to investigate it systematically uh, and so on and so on. I wonder though if there's and a difference. The, and these are ideas that are not, I, I just, I don't think they're just born out of pure reason. You, you, you couldn't have like a blank slate human being and just uh, thinking themselves into this, uh, this, uh, this way of thinking by themselves. But I think you have to sort of uh, place this person within, within a culture that's sort of cultivated by, by these philosophical ideas, by these uh, narratives that we tell each other and so on. That I think that was actually, yeah, very influential in the, uh, in the birth of modern science and lots of other historians think so as well. But I, I agree there's, there's a debate to be had there. But that just shows some of the nuances that's, uh, that's very easy to forget if you just get the uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson or uh, Richard Dawkins uh, portrayal of history. Well, I think that what those portrayals of history... Sorry, one second. <coughs> I think that what those portrayals of history really miss is that the danger is not necessarily in the belief the danger is in the power of the institution and how that power is used. And so when people talk about the danger of religion, I don't think that they're talking about the danger of belief. I think that they're talking about the danger of putting your faith into an institution that becomes the only institution that has, or the Which institution that has ultimate power and influence. It's extremely ironic coming from people at the top, at the, at the high throne of, an ins of institutional science. And that's exactly where I was going to go next, which is that if we're not careful, science becomes that same type of institution. And if you are attacking religion for the belief of in something supernatural, as opposed to attacking it for the institutional corruption, then you are blind when those same corruptions arise in your belief system. Because like you said, and David Foster Wallace said, everyone worships. You just have to take care that you're worshiping within a structure that is not becoming immensely powerful and corrupt. Potentially working against you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we usually talk of misuse of power because power is both the ability to do good as well as bad. You probably need some power if you're going to end the climate crisis. And also you talk about beliefs. Um, Again, if, if, if all human beings are striving towards some perceived good, that good probably comes from your beliefs. So I, I, I still think that your beliefs are immensely important, uh, even though you, you may still be living in the shadow of the Buddha. But I think it's immensely, immensely important whether you believe in accordance with a view of, say, that all human beings have uh, immeasurable uh, dignity and we are all of equal worth uh, despite our... Uh, yeah, despite our being vastly different in... Uh, uh, in uh, cult, uh, in in culture or religion or race or ethnicity or uh, yeah anything. Yeah, I, I I totally agree with that, and I think that the dark matter of belief in our society, the way that it works without us realizing that it works, is a pretty treacherous domain. Yeah, and the and the very exciting thing about being a philosopher is that you can sort of. You can sort of try to examine all of these uh, assumptions that we have, because we have so many assumptions in our culture that we think that well, this is just uh, this is just like a default mode. This is just like where we start. But then you see other cultures, and then you see other uh, points of history where people did not believe that. For example, that all all human beings are of equal worth. So yeah, it it, it sort of gives you the ground to sort of try to examine well, uh, what what justify these kind of ideas uh, are they sort of inherent to uh, uh, to human beings, or do they actually come from somewhere? Do they come from a story? A story that I can identify myself with? That is a really good place to stop, I think. Because that's, a, that's an enormous question that everybody has to ask themselves, I think. Listen, man, I am really glad that I got to meet you, and... I hope that we can talk again after I have thought more about these ideas down the road. Do you have any plans to put your ideas into anything like a book or, you know, you, you've written uh, 
some paper, or at least you've written this one article that I found. Is there, do you have any plans for, for future work? Is there a place where people can read more of your ideas? Well, unfortunately, probably not in English. <laughs> and that's because there are, there are so many great global thinkers that I, I probably don't have too much to contribute with. So I, I try to sort of emphasize the, the Norwegian market. I am um, right now. I'm working on actually a, a podcast, just trying to. Kind of my niche is just trying to show people that philosophy is immensely exciting, and uh, they might have been unfortunate uh, having people presented to them, but that this is just lots of old thinkers thinking lots of crazy ideas. But it's really about all the things that are important to us. Do I have any? Do my will influence anything? <laughs> Can I make a difference? Is there a purpose to life? Is there something worth striving for? And should I try to strive for truth, or is that just uh, illusory? And and so on. So I try to popularize popularize this kind of content uh, in Norwegian because that's kind of uh, yeah, that's the open niche for me, I guess. And I also want to write a book about uh, consciousness, the philosophy of mind, because yeah, I, I I think this mechanistic view of nature and uh, subsequent of mind does so much damage to how we view ourselves and our role in the world that um, yeah I guess we need some some writings that at least uh, challenge that uh, view that someone take as a default that'd be very cool yeah I look forward to that and we do have Norwegian listeners for for the record so what maybe just what's what's the name of your podcast have you published episodes yet no it's uh, I hope to well I, I have a personal podcast where I just uh, talk to a bunch of smart people like you do <laughs> that's a that's a great way to to meet people. That's called uh, Daniel Joachim, my name dot uh, org, which is also my blog. Uh, so both my blog and my podcast. I think there are one or two episodes in English, but um, yeah, there there are there are, there are so much uh, great content in in English. So I probably don't have too much to contribute with. Uh, well, you're very humble, sir, but but uh, you you have a very interesting perspective. So I I hope you will continue to proliferate your ideas. Yeah, yeah, I. Uh, <laughs> I think that's a, a great thing about a great thing about uh, studying the history of philosophy is that you see that all all these questions that I thought that I was just striving with in my in my teenage in my teenage years in my twenties uh, there are actually immensely clever people that has thought about all these kind of things uh, before. And actually, I uh, I have to be incredibly arrogant to think that well, uh, my own intellect can sort of surpass the uh, the insight that uh, they have given me. But perhaps I can sort of connect with the tradition and sort of try to. Think from the from the sh shoulders of intellectual giants and uh, and give it context. Yeah. You know, I think that's that's a huge part of the job of the scholar is to make something relevant to people in a new age. You know, there might be trivial differences between our lives, and there might be significant differences across time. But I think there's great value in putting old idea, resurrecting old ideas, and making them relevant to the modern world. So, so I wouldn't. Yeah. Uh, Definitely. I wouldn't downplay how important I, that is. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of why I cut out my niche because I think that uh, well, the most thing I can contribute with that's of value, I think I have from others. But uh, there's definitely a niche trying to sort of popularize, popularize that and try to contextualize that to a Norwegian audience that's that didn't know that uh, they were interested in, say, an Aristotle. Yeah, people need to know how to live, and I think that these old ideas, like you said, have been bouncing around for so long that the more that we return to them and, and think about them again, the more use that we can find from them because there is great utility there. Yeah, and they can probably give us a view that where we were intimate to nature. I think it's very exciting that uh, you have this whole movement called environmental philosophy that's sort of trying to uh, regain a view of nature where, where human beings don't see nature just as a machine to be uh, har harvested and utilized for its own purposes, but we try to sort of integrate... Uh, human beings with nature again. And they, they often land on ancient uh, Aristotelian uh, approaches. So there's kind of a, I think there's kind of a, um, an alliance between uh, eco-philosophical eco -philosoph philosophical approaches and uh, yeah, more ancient ideas. Yeah, definitely. Even when we're talking about combating climate crisis and trying to see the value of nature in itself. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't. I think that the the problems that our civilization faces are not really that different from the ones that others faced before us. You get to sufficient density, and you just you you run into the same program issues. Yeah. Very. Yeah, cool. I agree. 
Very cool. I hope I I do hope that once you once you work on your ideas some more and you have you know the the book written or you've written some more that we get a chance to talk again. It was really good. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, and uh, I'd love to speak to you again. It was uh, interesting. Excellent. All right, sir. Thank you for coming by, and uh, yeah, have a great rest of your night. You too. It's uh, yeah. It's in the middle of night here. You probably just. Uh, Going was, to have lunch or something. I was going to say it's pretty late. No, it's almost, <laughs> well, we eat, eat kind of early, but yeah, it must be really late there. So sleep well and uh, take care. Thank you for coming by. Thank you. Have a nice evening. All right. Bye. Bye, everybody. Hey, folks. We hope you enjoyed our conversation with Joachim. We wanted to do a quick little postscript for once and talk about, you know, the fact that we brought this person on the show because they had announced a worldview that we had encountered very rarely and we were really excited to find somebody who also had this suspicion that the laws of nature which we hold on high are extremely powerful in a technological sense and they're very very precise at describing what's happening but they don't have a lot of explanatory power in terms of what the cause of those actual laws is and by the end of the conversation, it became clear that Joachim has a very theological answer to this question. In other words, well, the laws are there because, well, the divine nature of the universe said that they must be so. We have a very different perspective. Uh, as much as we have reverence for the divine nature of the universe, we think that the laws emerge because of the material properties of the actors involved in the physical landscape. And we didn't really push him too hard on this. And so we wanted to at least give a little follow-up to say that if you're interested in that idea, we have a whole YouTube channel devoted to it called Material Atomics, which you can find linked up here. And we get together periodically and discuss possible solutions to the material explanations for these basic physical laws. We're also working on a book right now about the very same topic, so you can look forward to that in the next year or two. <laughs> the timeline for that keeps receding. Yeah, well, <laughs> books are hard. I didn't. I didn't know how hard books were. But. Yeah, well, yeah, and and getting people to think about this idea is even interesting. Is perhaps a multi-tiered phase of books. So, at any rate, we didn't really get to push him too hard on these ideas, but I think that was for the better because that's an entire project and requires a much bigger exposition than we had space for in this conversation. Not only that, but it's like, I think that what happens when somebody shows up who has an idea that is fully formed, it's not like you can tell them outright that you just straight up disagree with the conclusions that they've come to. Like, that's kind of an antisocial, aggressive position to take. And so I, I think we wanted to record this postscript just to give people a pointer to where they could find the work where we describe in great detail and at great length the way that we see the laws of the universe emerging. Perfect. So we hope you enjoyed this discussion and we hope you'll come over to Material Atomics and continue the discussion over there. Mm -hmm.